Preface of Contending Forces. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Margaret Espayat. Contending Forces by Pauline E. Hopkins. Preface. In giving this little romance expression in print, I am not actuated by a desire for notoriety or for profit. But to do all that I can in a humble way to raise the stigma of degradation from my race. While I make no apology for my somewhat abrupt and daring venture within the wide field of romantic literature, I ask the kind indulgence of the generous public for the many crudities which I know appear in the work, and their approval of whatever may impress them as being of value to the Negro race and to the world at large. The colored race has historians, lecturers, ministers, poets, judges, and lawyers, men of brilliant intellects who have arrested the favorable attention of this busy, energetic nation. But, after all, it is the simple, homely tale, unassumingly told, which cements the bond of brotherhood among all classes and all complexions. Fiction is of great value to any people as a preserver of manner and customs, religious, political, and social. It is a record of growth and development from generation to generation. No one will do this for us. We must ourselves develop the men and women who will faithfully portray the inmost thoughts and feelings of the Negro with all the fire and romance which lie dormant in our history and as yet unrecognized by writers of the Anglo Saxon race. The incidents portrayed in the early chapters of the book actually occurred. Ample proof of this may be found in the archives of the courthouse at New Bern, North Carolina, and at the national seat of government, Washington, D.C. In these days of mob violence, when lynch law is raising its head like a venomous monster, more particularly in the southern portion of the great American Republic, the retrospective mind will dwell upon the history of the past, seeking there a solution of these monstrous outbreaks under a government founded upon the greatest and brightest of principles for the elevation of mankind. While we ponder the philosophy of cause and effect, the world is horrified by a fresh outbreak, and the shocked mind wonders that in this, the brightest epoch of the Christian era, such things are. Mob law is nothing new. Southern sentiment has not been changed. The old ideas, close in analogy to the spirit of the buccaneers, who formed in many instances the first settlers of the Southland, still prevail, and break forth clothed in new forms to force the whole republic into an acceptance of its principles. Rule or ruin is the motto which is committing the most beautiful portion of our glorious country to a cruel revival of piratical methods and, finally, to the introduction of anarchy. Is this not so? Let us compare the happenings of one hundred, two hundred years ago, with those of today. The difference between then and now, if any there be, is so slight as to be scarcely worth mentioning. The atrocity of the acts committed one hundred years ago are duplicated today, when slavery is supposed no longer to exist. I have tried to tell an impartial story, leaving it to the reader to draw conclusions. I have tried to portray our hard struggles here in the North to obtain a respectable living and a partial education. I have presented both sides of the dark picture, lynching and concubinage, truthfully and without vituperation, pleading for that justice of heart and mind for my people which the Anglo-Saxon in America never withholds from suffering humanity. In Chapter 8 I have used for the address of the Honorable Herbert Clapp the statements and accusations made against the Negro by ex-Governor Northern of Georgia in his memorable address before the Congregational Club at Tremont Temple, Boston, Massachusetts, May 22, 1899. In Chapter 15 I have made Will Smith's argument in answer to the Honorable Herbert Clapp, a combination of the best points made by well-known public speakers in the United States, white and black, in defense of the Negro. I feel my own deficiencies too strongly to attempt original composition on this subject at this crisis in the history of the Negro in the United States. I have introduced enough of the exquisitely droll humor peculiar to the Negro, 
a work like this would not be complete without it, to give a bright touch to an otherwise gruesome subject. The Author End of Preface Chapter One of Contending Forces This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Contending Forces by Pauline E. Hopkins, Chapter One A Retrospect of the Past We wait beneath the furnace blast, the pangs of transformation. Not painlessly doth God recast and mould anew the nation. Hot burns the fire where wrongs expire, nor spares the hand that from the land uproots the ancient evil. J. G. Whittier In the early part of the year 1800, the agitation of the inhabitants of Great Britain over the increasing horrors of the slave trade carried on in the West Indian possessions of the empire was about reaching a climax. Every day the terrible things done to the slaves were becoming public talk, until the best English humanitarians, searching for light upon the subject, became sick at heart over the discoveries that they made, and were led to declare the principle, the air of England is too pure for any slave to breathe. To go back a little way in the romantic history of the emancipation of the slaves in the islands will not take much time, and will, I hope, be as instructive as interesting. Tales of the abuses of the slaves, with all the sickening details, had reached the Quaker community as early as 1783, and that tender-hearted people looked about themselves to see what steps they could take to ameliorate the condition of the Negroes in the West Indies, and to discourage the continuation of the trade along the African coast. Thomas Clarkson, a student at Cambridge, was drawn into writing a prize essay on the subject, and became so interested that he allied himself with the Quakers and investigated the subject for himself, thereby confirming his own belief that Providence had never made that to be wise that was immoral, and that the slave trade was as impolitic as it was unjust. After strenuous efforts by Mr. Pitt and Mr. Fox, Parliament became interested, and instituted an inquiry into the abuses of the slave trade. Finally, Mr. Wilberforce was drawn into the controversy, and for sixteen years waged an incessant warfare against the planters, meeting with defeat in his plans for ten consecutive years, but finally in 1807 he was successful, and the slave trade was abolished. These assailants of the slave trade had promised not to try to abolish slavery, but in a short time they learned that the trade was still carried on in ships sailing under the protection of false flags. Tales of the cruelties practiced upon the helpless chattels were continually reaching the ears of the British public, some of them such as to sicken the most cold-hearted and indifferent. For instance, causing a child to whip his mother until the blood ran— if a slave looked his master in the face, his limbs were broken. Women in the first stages of their accouchement, upon refusing to work, were placed in the treadmill, where terrible things happened, too dreadful to relate. Through the efforts of Granville Sharp, the chairman of the London Committee, Lord Stanley, Minister of the Colonies, introduced into the House of Commons his bill for emancipation. Lord Stanley Bill proposed gradual emancipation, and was the best thing those men of wisdom could devise. Earnestly devoted to their task, they sought to wipe from the fair escutcheon of the empire the awful blot which was upon it. By the adoption of the bill, Great Britain not only liberated a people from the cruelties of their masters, but at the same time took an important step forward in the onward march of progress, which the most enlightened nations are unconsciously forced to make by the great law of advancement, for the civility of no race can be perfect whilst another race is degraded. In this bill of gradual emancipation certain conditions were proposed. All slaves were entitled to be known as apprenticed laborers, and to acquire thereby all the rights and privileges of free men. These conditions were that predials should owe three-fourths of the profits of their labors to their masters for six years, and the non-predials for four years. 
the other fourth of the apprentice's time was to be his own, which he might sell to his master or to other persons, and at the end of the term of years fixed he should be free. In the winter of 1790, when these important changes in the life of the Negro of the West Indies were pending, many planters were following the course of events with great anxiety. Many feared that in the end their slaves would be taken from them without recompense, and thereby render them and their families destitute. Among these planters was the family of Charles Montfort of the island of Bermuda. Bermuda's fifteen square miles of area lays six hundred miles from the nearest American coast. Delightful is this land, formed from coral reefs, flat and fertile, which to the eye appears but as a pinpoint upon the ocean's broad bosom, one of a thousand islands in a tropic sea. Once Bermuda was second only to Virginia in its importance as a British colony. Once it held the carrying trade of the New World— once was known as the Gibraltar of the Atlantic, although its history has been that of a simple and peaceful people. Its importance to the mother country as a military and naval station has drawn the paternal bonds of interest closer as the years have flown by. Indeed, Great Britain has been kind to the colonists of this favored island from its infancy, sheltering and shielding them so carefully that the iron hand of the master has never shone beneath the velvet glove. So Bermuda has always been intensely British, intensely loyal. Today, at the beginning of the new century, Bermuda presents itself, outside of its importance as a military station for a great power, as a vast sanatorium for the benefit of invalids. A temperate climate, limpid rivers, the balmy fragrance and freshness of the air, no winter, nature changing only in the tints of its foliage, have contributed to its renown as a health-giving region, and thus Shakespeare's magic island of Prospero and Miranda has become, indeed to the traveller, the spot of earth uncursed, to show how all things were created first. Mr. Montfort was the owner of about seven hundred slaves. He was well known as an exporter of tobacco, sugar, coffee, onions, and other products so easily grown in that salubrious climate from which he received large returns. He was neither a cruel man nor an avaricious one, but, like all men in commercial life, or traders doing business in their own productions, he lost sight of the individual right or wrong of the matter, or, we might say with more truth, that he perverted right to be what was conducive to his own interests, and felt that by owning slaves he did no man a wrong, since it was the common practice of those all about him, and he had been accustomed to this peculiar institution all his life. Indeed, slavery never reached its lowest depths in this beautiful island, but a desire for England's honor and greatness had become a passion with the inhabitants, and restrained the planters, from committing the ferocious acts of brutality so commonly practised by the Spaniards. In many cases African blood had become diluted from amalgamation with the higher race, and many of these coloured people became rich planters or businessmen, themselves owning slaves, through the favours heaped upon them by their white parents. This being the case, there might even have been a strain of African blood polluting the fair stream of Montfort's vitality, or even his wife's, which fact would not have caused him one instant's uneasiness. Moreover, he was a good master, and felt that while he housed his slaves well, fed them with the best of food suited to their occupations and the climate, and did not cruelly beat them, they fared better with him than they would have with another, perhaps, or even if they held property themselves. The speeches of Mr. Pitt, Mr. Burke, and others, together with the general trend of public sentiment as expressed through the medium of the British press, had now begun to make an impression upon some of the more humane of the planters on this island, and among them was Mr. Montfort. Uneasiness now took the place of his former security, thought would obtrude itself upon him, and in the quiet hours of the night this man fought out the battle which conscience waged within him, and right prevailed to the extent of his deciding that he would free his slaves, but in his own way. 
he determined to leave Bermuda, and after settling in some other land he would gradually free his slaves without impoverishing himself, bestow on each one a piece of land, and finally with easy conscience he would retire to England and there lead the happy life of an English gentleman of fortune. With this end in view, being a man of affairs and well acquainted with the whole of the American continent, he naturally turned his eyes toward the United States, where the institution flourished, and the people had not actually awakened to the folly and wickedness exemplified in the enslavement of their fellow beings. For reasons which were never known, he finally made choice of Newburn, North Carolina, for a home. Sunday was and is the high holiday in all tropical climes. On that day the slave forgot his bonds. It was noon, the early service of the Church of England was ended. The clergyman of the parish had accompanied Charles Montfort home. Mrs. Montfort was visiting friends, so the two gentlemen dined alone. The clergyman was rather glad that he had the opportunity of seeing Mr. Montfort alone, and had used all his powers of persuasion to turn him from his proposed exodus. It was of no avail, as the good man soon found, and, with a sigh, he finally took his hat and prepared to leave. Both stood outside the house upon the broad walk beneath the shade of the fragrant cedars and the fruitful tamarind trees. The silence of deep feeling was between these two men. The clergyman could only remember the reverence he had always received, and the loving service given him by his family. Montfort thought with pain of the holy ministrations of this silver-haired man who had pronounced the solemn words that bound him to his gentle wife, had baptized his children, and, tenderest act of all, had buried the little daughter whose grave was yonder, beneath the flowering trees in the churchyard. Yes, it was sad to part and leave all these tender ties of friendship behind. The bishop will come himself, Charles, to persuade you that this is a dangerous step you are about to take, finally the good man said, breaking the silence. Why dangerous? Is it any more so for me than those who left England to build a home here in the wilderness? Different, very different. The mother hand was still over them, even in these wilds. Out there, Annie pointed in the direction of the bay. They tell me that for all their boasted freedom, the liberty of England is not found, and human life is held cheaply in the eyes of men who are mere outlaws. Ah, but the bishop, he continued with a sigh, he can tell you, he has seen. He is not a weak old man like me. He will talk you out of this plan of separation from all your friends. Again silence fell upon them. In the direction of the square a crowd of slaves were enjoying the time of idleness. Men were dancing with men, and women with women, to the strange monotonous music of drums without tune, relics of the tom-tom in the wild African life, which haunted them in dreamland. Still there was pleasure even for a cultivated musical ear in the peculiar variation of the rhythm. The scanty raiment of gay-colored cotton stuffs set off the varied complexions, yellow, bronze, white, the flashing eyes, the gleaming teeth, and gave infinite variety to the scene. Over there waterfalls fell in the sunlight in silvery waves, party-colored butterflies of vivid coloring, and hummingbirds flashed through the air with electrical radiance. Gay parakeets swung and chattered from the branches of the trees. "'Where, my son,' said the clergyman, indicating the landscape with a wave of his hand, "'will you find a scene more beautiful than this? How can you leave it and those who love you and yours?' "'Beautiful indeed, and I will confess that it grows dearer as the time for my departure draws near,' answered Montfort. "'I will walk with you,' he continued, as the clergyman turned in the direction of the road. As they passed through the wide entrance gates, a negro woman was weeding her little garden. Her piccaninny was astride her back, spurring his mother as a rider his horse. The woman and the child looked up and smiled at the master and his guest, and the woman put the child on the ground and stood upright to bob a queer little curtsy. They walked along in silence until they reached the plaza. "'My son, will you not be persuaded?' "'Father, I have made up my mind firmly, after due consideration. I believe it is for the best.' 
They paused a moment at the square, then the holy man said solemnly, as he raised his hand in benediction, If it then be for the best, which God grant it may be, I pray the good Father of us all to keep you in safety and in perfect peace. He turned and disappeared in the crowd. Charles Montfort was immediately surrounded by his friends, who greeted him joyously, for he was a genial man, and had endeared himself greatly to his neighbors. "'Still determined to leave us, Charles?' inquired one. "'Yes, for the good of myself and family. How can we submit tamely to the loss of our patrimonies, without an effort to reimburse ourselves when a friendly land invites us to share its hospitality?' "'There is truth in your argument for all who, like you, Charles, have a large venture in slaves. "'Thank heaven I am so poor that a change of laws will not affect me,' said one. "'Where a man's treasure is, there is also his heart. It is nature.' "'Almost you persuade me, Charles, to do likewise,' remarked another. "'As I have told you, I will retain my patrimony and free my slaves, too, by this venture in the United States, under a more liberal government than ours.' "'Ah, Charles,' remarked another listener, "'you forget the real difference between our government and that of the United States. And then the social laws are so different. You will never be able to accustom yourself to the habits of a republic. Do you not remember the planters from Georgia and Carolina who fought for good King George and were staunch royalists? They retired to the Bahamas when our cause was lost in the American colonies. My brother has just returned from a trip there.' He tells strange tales of their surprise at many things we do here. I fear it is but a cold welcome you will receive from men of their class. Certainly, replied Montfort, I shall try to be a good subject or citizen of whatever country I may be compelled to reside in for a long or short time. But surely you will not expose your wife to the inconveniences of life in that country, said another. She has had her choice, but prefers hardships with me to life without me, proudly returned Montfort. A willful man must have his way, murmured one who had not yet spoken, and I will give you three months to stay in the land of savages before you will be returning to us bag and baggage. Well, laughed Montfort, we shall see. Twilight had fallen now, and Montfort bared his head to the refreshing sea breeze which fluttered every leaf when he bade his friends good-night finally and started on his homeward walk the arguments of the good clergyman and of his friends were present in his harassed mind and he wondered if he were doing wrong not to be prevailed upon to yield to the opinions of others once he almost determined that he would give it all up and remain in this land of love and beauty to collect his scattered thoughts and calm his mind he turned toward the bay and stood upon the beach still allowing the breeze to play about his heated temples. Never before had he appreciated his home so much as now, when he contrasted it with the comparative barrenness of the new spot he had chosen. The water was alive with marine creatures, the sea aflame. The air was full of light-giving insects, incessantly moving, which illumined the darkness and gave life to every inanimate object. Over all, the moon and stars were set in the cloudless, deep blue sky of coming night. Alas, his good angel fled with the darkness, and morning found him more determined than ever to go on with his project. When it became generally known in Bermuda that Charles Montfort had decided to leave the place of his birth and establish himself in a foreign land, many friends gathered about him and advised him to reconsider his determination. Montfort laughingly invited them to join him in his new venture, and then earnestly pointed out to them the dangers which threatened their fortunes. He painted his plans in glowing colors, and ended by promising them that in less than twenty-five years he would land in England, a retired planter, his former slaves free and happy, and he himself rich and honored. Having an immense amount of property to transport, it happened that Mr. Montfort was compelled to make two trips to Newburn before he removed his family to their new home. But after much energetic work and many difficulties, the little family looked through blinding tears at the receding shores of what had been a happy home. A week later a noble ship stood off the shores of North Carolina. 
On the deck was Charles Montfort. His wife hung upon his arm. Beside the devoted couple were Charles, Jr., named for his father, and Jesse, the young darling of his mother's heart. Silently they gazed upon the fair scene before them, each longing for the land so recently left behind them, though no word of regret was spoken. End of chapter 1《Chapter Two of Contending Forces by Pauline E. Hopkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two: The Days Before the War. O Freedom, thou art not as poets dream, a fair young girl with light and delicate limbs. Thy birthright was not given by human hands; thou wert twin-born with man. The shores of Pamco Sound presented a motley crowd of slaves, overseers, owners of vessels, and a phantasmagoric landscape very charming to eyes unaccustomed to such scenes. It was near the noon siesta. In the harbor lay three or four vessels ready to be loaded with their freight of rice, tobacco, or cotton. The sun poured its level rays straight down upon the heads of all. A band of slaves sang in a musical monotone. And kept time to the music of their song as they unloaded a barge that had just arrived. Turn that hand spike round and round, hold hard, honey, hold hard, honey. Brackman tote the buckra's load, hold hard, honey, hold hard, honey. Never before seed a nigger like you, hold hard, honey, hold hard, honey. Allers tink about your old brack Sue, hold hard, honey, hold hard, honey. If I was an alligator, what did I do? Hold hard, honey, hold hard, honey. Run way with old Brack Sue. Hold hard, honey, hold hard, honey. Massa Ketcher, what did he do? Hi, hi, honey, hi, hi, honey. Cut your back in old Brack Sue's. Hey, hey, honey, hey, hey, honey. I cuss Massa in defense. Hold hard, honey, hold hard, honey. Massa Don Ya make no difference. Hold hard, honey, hold hard, honey. Turn dat hand spike round and round, hold hard, honey, hold hard, honey. Brack man tote de buckra's load, hold hard, honey, hold hard, honey. As the refrain died away, the bell for the noon rest sounded faintly in the distance, gradually drawing nearer, and again their rich and plaintive voices blended together in sweet cadences as they finished placing the heavy load to the satisfaction of their drivers. Hark dat merry purty bell go, jingle lingle jingle lingle jingle bell, jingle lingle jingle lingle jingle lingle bell, jingle bell jingle bell. Even so sang the children of Israel in their captivity as they sat by the rivers of Babylon awaiting deliverance. Just now a ship, which had some time since appeared as a dark spot on the horizon, turned her majestic prow and steered for the entrance to the sound. Immediately the pilot boat in the harbor put out to her. Every one on the shore became eagerly intent upon the strange ship, and they watched the pilot climb aboard with all the interest which usually attends the slightest cause for excitement in a small community. The ship came on very slowly, for there was little wind under topsail, jib, and foresail, the British flag at the peak and the American flag at the fore. The people on shore could see the captain standing by the pilot. The anchor ready to be dropped, and the bowsprit shrouds loose. But now their interest was divided with a new arrival. A man on horseback rode down to the shaky wooden platform, which served as a landing place for passengers. Behind him, at a respectful distance, rode a white haired mulatto. The man leaped from his horse and threw his reins to the slave, signalled a couple of negroes in a boat. Jumped into it as they, obedient to his sign, pulled alongside the wharf, and was rowed swiftly out to the advancing ship, which was now making considerable headway toward the shore. Among the idlers on the wharf was one whom every one addressed as Bill. He was large, or rather burly, carried a rawhide in his hand, and from his air of authority toward them was evidently the overseer of the gang of slaves who were loading the tobacco barge. From out the crowd, a man who had been sitting idly on a bale of cotton moved toward him. Hello, Bale," he said, addressing the owner of the rawhide. 
"'Howdy, Hank,' returned Bill, surveying the other curiously. "'Where in time did you drop from?' Hank did not reply directly. He shifted the tobacco quid in his mouth from one cheek to the other, then, with a nod of the head toward the approaching vessel, asked, "'Where's she from?' "'Hain't been in town lately, I reckon, or you'd know all about the island queen from Bermudy. Planter named Montfort on her. He's moving his niggers here to Carolina, getting too hot for him back thar,' replied Bill, with a backward jerk of his thumb in the supposed direction of Bermuda. "'How's things up your way?' "'Fair, fair to Midland, Bill. There's been some talk about a rising among the niggers, and so we just took a few of them and strung em up for an example to the rest.' I tell you, Bill, we just don't spect to have no foolin' about this year question of who's on top as regards a gentleman's own and his niggers, and whomsoever ter goes ter foolin' with that our particular pint of discussion is gwine to be made an example of, even if it's a white man. Didn't hear nothin' about a circus up our way, did yer? Bill scratched his chin and shook his head in the negative. Well, twas this here way, Jed Powers. You member Dan Powers, Jed, don't yer? Dan that was tarred and feathered for selling good likely whisker to niggers? Bill nodded in the affirmative. Jed Powers was seed walkin' with Jimison's wench Violi. Be blowed if he wasn't gettin' ready to cut and run to Kennedy with her. Don't believe you're durned if I do, said Bill. Fact. Be durned if it ain't just so. Wow, of all the unnatural cusses. But his worst offense, in general, was that he was meanin' fur to marry her. Hank paused in his narrative to allow a full appreciation of his statement to be impressed upon Bill's mind. "'Worse and worse,' groaned the latter. "'What is we comin' to by thunder? I allus took Jed to be a decent sort of cuss, too. What's the committee doin' about it?' "'Well, we sought out to stop that fun, anyhow.' We got him after a hot chase, and we put him in jail, and last week we gov him his trial. Jedge sentenced him to fifty lashes and hangin' by the neck until he was dead, but somehow another folks is gettin' squeamish. Jedge don't durst to hang him. He'll just give him the fifty lashes and a talkin' to on the immorality of his axin' ways. Jedge told him he was young, and had a chance to pent from the desolate ways of his youth of which his worst failin' was a wantin' to marry niggers. Leastwise he'd end in hell, sure. Jedge told him everything cordin' to law and justice. We was calculatin' to have a celebration to which all the leadin' citizens of this county would have been bid, but, of course, not havin' the hangin' sort of took the ginger out of the whole business. I hain't a doubt of your hospitality in the case of the event, Hank. We always got along mighty comfortable together, replied Bill, nodding an emphatic approval of all that Hank had said. The whole speech had been liberally punctuated with copious floods of tobacco-juice, which formed a small river between the two men. "'Best thing I know of down our way,' said Bill, after they had taken another good look at the ship. "'The best thing I know of was a raffle over to Jellison's auction rooms. A raffle's a great thing for picking up bargains in niggers and horses.' This particular one was for a bay horse, a new light buggy and harness, and a mulatto gal, Sal. The whole thing was worth fifteen hundred dollars, and we'd had fifteen hundred chances at a dollar a head. Highest throw took first choice, lowest the remainder. Winners to pay twenty dollars each for refreshments. "'Little bit selfish of you, Bill, to keep all that to yourself,' said Hank, giving Bill a reproachful glance. "'Mabby so, mabby so. But you won't lose nothing, Hank, if I can help here in the future. "'Pears like someone was a-tellin' me,' he continued reflectively, "'that you was a-workin' for the county about that time for board and clothes.' "'Be darned if I wasn't,' replied Hank, with great candor. "'Shot at a free nigger and killed Brady's dog, Pete. "'If it had been the nigger I'd happened to kill, it would have been all right.' but bein' twas a blooded hound that had tread hundreds of runaways, it was another question. And not having the money to pay a fine, and Brady being purty mad, why, I went in for a month. Well, as I was saying, to proceed, by a lucky chance it was my fust choice, and I chose the gal. I knowed she was a first-class breeder, and my money was sure for a hundred percent on her. 
"'I swear to gosh, but you're right, Bill. Made her with the right sort, and you's got your own money.' Both men now turned their attention to the advancing ship. "'I see old Pollock's got him in tow,' remarked Hank reflectively, after a moment's silence. "'And Pollock's as crafty as can be. No offense meant, you know. Seems he's your boss still. Mean cuss if he's rich as a judge,' he continued. "'Suppose they've got a heap of money, too.' "'Can't say as to that,' replied Bill. "'But they bought Pollock's old place, "'and it looks as though money might be plenty "'the way everything has been fixed up for the missus.' The noon hours were now over, and a great deal of confusion reigned, caused by the arrival of a ship in port with so rich a man as Mr. Montford aboard. The two friends became separated in the ensuing bustle which attended the landing of the party. During the preceding conversation a carriage and teams for transporting the baggage and slaves had drawn up alongside the shore, and as Mr. Montfort stepped on the rickety wharf and assisted his wife to do the same, a murmur of involuntary admiration ran through the motley crowd of rough white men and ignorant slaves. Grace Montfort was a dream of beauty even among beautiful women. Tall and slender, her form was willowy, although perfectly molded. Her complexion was creamy in its whiteness, of the tint of the camellia. Her hair, a rich golden brown, fell in rippling masses far below the waistline. Brown eyes, large and soft as those seen in the fawn, heavy black eyebrows marking a high white forehead, and features as clearly cut as a cameo, completed a most lovely type of southern beauty. The two children followed their mother closely. They were sturdy boys who resembled her in the beauty of their features, and in Jessie, the baby, a still greater resemblance could be traced, because the hair had been allowed to remain in long, soft curls. So they came ashore to their new home, obsequiously waited upon by Mr. Pollock, and lovingly attended by their numerous slaves. In an instant the family was seated in the waiting vehicle, and before the spectators could fully realize the beauty and elegance of the newcomers, they were whirled away, and the carriage was lost in a cloud of dust. Hank Davis and Bill Sampson met once more before they left the wharf. "'If they hain't got an overseer, I'm going to apply for the job,' said Hank. "'Never seed such a beauty in my life.' Bill Sampson scratched his head meditatively. "'Strikes me, Hank.' that that air female's got a black streak in hair somewhere. Hank stared at Bill a moment, as though he thought he had suddenly lost his senses. Then he burst into a loud guffaw. "'You get out, Bill Sampson!' "'Well, maybe,' said Bill. "'Maybe so. There's too much cream color in the face and too little blood seen under the skin for a genuine white woman. You can't tell nothing about these Britishers.' They're allers squeamish bout thar nigger brats. Yes, sir, ah, very squeamish. I've hearn tell that they think nothin' of educatin' thar black brats and freein' em and makin' em rich. You go to the devil, returned Hank, as he moved away. You're worse than an old nigger. Allers seein' a possum up a tree, and tain't no possum tall, nothin' but a skunk. Apologists tell us, as an excuse for the barbarous practice of slavery, that it was a godlike institution for the spread of the gospel of the meek and lowly carpenter's son, and that the African savage brought to these shores in chains was a most favored being. Such may be the thoughts of the careless and superficial mind, but when we survey the flotsam and jetsam left from the wreck of the Civil War, we can deceive ourselves no longer. We must confess that the natural laws which govern individuals and communities never relax in their operation. The fruit of slavery was poisonous and bitter. Let us rejoice that it no longer exists. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of Contending Forces by Pauline e. Hopkins this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3. Coming Events Cast Their Shadows Before In sooth I know not why I am so sad. It wearies me, you say it wearies you. But how I caught it, found it, or came by it, what stuff tis made of, whereof it is born, I am to learn. 
and such a want wit sadness makes of me that I have much ado to know myself. Merchant of Venice The old Pollock homestead was an exquisite spot. The house was a long, low, rambling structure, consisting of many large, airy rooms inside, and ornamented without by piazzas supported by huge pillars. Immense trees shaded the driveway and embowered the stately white mansion. Gay parterres of flowers ornamented the rolling lawn, which divided the great house from the negro quarters, which were picturesquely visible at a convenient distance from it. Within the house Mr. Montfort had gathered all the treasures which could possibly add to the comfort and pleasure of his lovely wife. Beautiful rugs covered the floors, fine paintings adorned the walls, gleaming statuary flashed upon one from odd nooks and corners. In the library music had found a home in the most comfortable corner of the room. On a table one might find a volume of Goethe in the original, on the grand piano the score of a then popular opera, while a magnificent harp standing near hinted of musical talents highly cultivated. Business had prospered with Montfort, his crops flourished, but a nameless trouble seemed to be halting upon the threshold of the home he loved, and to threaten those whom he cherished so fondly. The first year of residence in New Bern had been very pleasant for the Montforts. Society such as it was, opened its arms to the family, and voted the highly cultured wife and cherub children great additions. The house was a favorite resort for all the young people of the neighborhood. Mrs. Montfort had been educated in England, and had brought with her to the provincial families with whom she now associated all the refinements of the old world. Having great wealth for the times, she had always been indulged in every whim by the doting bachelor uncle, who had made her his heiress, but who had died soon after her marriage to Charles Montfort. As Grace Montfort, she found again the love her uncle had delighted to lavish upon his adopted child. Possessed of a bright, joyous nature, she liked nothing better than to gather about her the young men and women of the neighborhood, and make life pleasant for them, and they in turn learned from her customs and refinements which otherwise might have never come their way. Every one voted her the dearest and most beautiful woman they had ever known, and all would have gone merry as a marriage bell, but, if it were not for the buts and ifs of this life, what a pleasant place the world would be. Into this paradise of good feelings and admiration came Anson Pollock, with his bitter envy and his unlawful love, and finally with his determination to possess the lovely Grace Montfort at all hazards. Gradually the friendly relations of the neighbors turned to coldness and reserve. It was whispered about that Montfort was about to free his slaves. This in itself was a dangerous doctrine at that time in that part of the world, and a man suspected of entertaining ideas of freedom for slaves must either change his tactics or his residence, or else forfeit life and property. Then again Bill Sampson's words to Hank Davis had somehow found a voice, and the suspicion of negro blood in the veins of Mrs. Montfort was a death-blow to a proud spirit and social aspirations. These two serious charges had spread abroad like wildfire. It was a hot morning, a very hot morning in early summer. There had been no rain for some time. Mrs. Montfort lay in a hammock outside the breakfast-room windows. Lucy, her maid, was mending lace and children's garments a short distance away. Lucy was Mrs. Montfort's foster-sister. Both were born on the same day. Their relations had always been those of inseparable friends rather than of mistress and slave. "'No rain to-day, Lucy. I never used to mind the heat at home,' this with a sigh. "'How fair it must be over the blue waters of the bay. I can almost smell the cedars outside the entrance gates.' "'Yes, Miss Grace,' to Lucy her mistress was always Miss Grace. "'I do feel sort of squeamish myself sometimes when I tink of the gals all dancin' Sundays in the square. But reckon we'll get used to these people here arter a while, leastwise I hope so.' Mrs. Montfort did not reply, and her maid noticed, as she glanced anxiously at her mistress, that a frown was on her face. Lucy sighed. Miss Grace had been noted once for her sunny, cheerful temper. Now all was changed. 
Beyond the rolling lawn, fields of cotton could be seen, the leaves twisting in the heat and the steady glare of the sun. Zigzag fences separated the cotton from fields of corn. Away in the distance, dim aisles of pine trees stretched their dark arms toward the heavens, their dark foliage suggestive of cool shadows and quiet glades. The road wound in and out among the pines through a woodland and terminated in the highway just visible from the piazza. Inside the long open windows, little Jesse played at building houses with the bags of golden eagles that his father kept in a drawer of his escritoire. "'Grace! Grace! Lucy!' called the child. "'My houses won't stay up. Come in and help me.' Just then a group appeared coming around a corner of an outbuilding. Two men walked beside a pony, astride whose back sat Master Charles. As they approached the house, the gentlemen swept off their wide-brimmed hats in a gallant salute to Mrs. Montfort, which she returned by rising from her recumbent position and dropping a low curtsey. The gentlemen were Mr. Montfort and Mr. Pollock. Jesse, hearing the pony's feet, came out the window and ran down the piazza steps to his father, who, as Charles sprang to the ground, lifted the excited child to the pony's back. Mrs. Montfort watched the approach of the little procession with a pleased smile. She made a fair picture in her elaborately embroidered white morning robe, her beautiful hair arranged in drooping curls at the sides of her head, as was the fashion of the time. "'See me, Mama Grace!' cried Jessie as he clapped his little hands and dug the heels of his tiny slippered feet into the pony's side, in imitation of his father on horseback. As Montfort watched him, the picture of his last Sunday in Bermuda arose before him, the little negro child astride his mother's back, spurring her like a rider his horse, and in his ears rang the pleasant voice of his silver-haired pastor. At the piazza steps he called the servant to take away the pony and turned to enter the house, followed by Mr. Pollock, with Jessie in his arms and Charles by his side. Jessie kept up an incessant chatter. They passed through the breakfast-room where Montfort placed the child upon the floor. "'Charles, help me build my houses,' he cried, attracted to his late employment at sight of the Golden Eagles. "'See, Papa, all my houses tumble down. Charles' houses don't fall down, but mine always do. Come and help me, Charles.' "'You are not patient enough, my son,' replied the father, smiling down upon his petulance. "'You must be patient and persevere, and after a while you'll be able to make your houses stand.' Isn't that right, Mr. Pollock? Pollock stood a little apart, gazing in amazement at the scene before him. Golden eagles, given to a child to play with, was a little beyond him. He made no direct reply to Mr. Montfort's remark, and if the latter had been an observant man, he might have been a bit puzzled at the expression on his face. But Charles Montfort was ingenuousness itself, seen in no man an enemy. Anson Pollock was his opposite. His ruling passion was covetousness. His eyes were fairly dazzled by the sight of the gold, so carelessly strewing the floor. It positively took away his breath. "'Come, Pollock, we will talk over those matters in my study,' said Montfort presently. "'My son,' he added as he paused at the doorway, "'be careful not to lose your ducats. They are your portion to pay your college bills when you cross the ocean to finish your education.' "'Going to send him abroad to study?' carelessly inquired Pollock. "'Oh, yes, America's all right for me, but bonny England for my boys.' Anson Pollock, whom Charles Montfort had chosen for his friend, was a man of dashing appearance. He carried his years jauntily, had made a good opinion of himself where women were concerned. He was made much of by the ladies in the vicinity because of his wealth. It mattered not that his wife had died mysteriously— Rumor said his ill-treatment and infidelity had driven her to suicide. It had even been whispered that he had not hesitated to whip her by proxy through his overseer, Bill Sampson, in the same way he did his slaves. But rumor is a lying jade. Nevertheless, his fair speech, auburn curls, and deep blue eyes, so falsely smiling, won his way, and Mr. Pollock was the popular ladies' man of two counties. He had showered Mrs. Montfort with assiduous attention since her arrival three years before, but he soon found that he made no headway. 
Once he dared to tell her of his passion, that from the first moment he saw her aboard the island queen he had been maddened by her beauty. "'Why do you tell me this?' she cried, in angry amazement at his daring. "'Am I so careless of my husband's honour that his friends feel at liberty to insult me?' granted that I overstep the bounds of friendship in speaking thus to you, but it is from no lack of respect, rather the deed of one who risks all upon one throw of the dice. Have mercy, I pray you, and grant me your friendship, your love. Then Grace Montfort said, while her eyes blazed with wrath, Mr. Pollock, we are strangers here, my husband and I. He trusts you, and I have no wish to disturb that trust— but if you ever address such words to me again, I shall let Mr. Montfort know the kind of man you are. I promise you that he will know how to deal with you. This conversation had taken place one night at a grand fete where Grace had been the belle of the assembly. They were in the conservatory at the time. Anson Pollock was not accustomed to having his advances received in this way by any woman whom he elected to honor with his admiration. As the indignant woman swept back to the ballroom, he stood and watched her with an evil look which meant no good. After that they met as usual, but Pollock had never ventured to speak to her again of love. Outwardly he was the same suave, genial gentleman, but within his breast was a living fire of hatred. The two men became faster friends than ever. Mrs. Montfort was pleased to have it so. They had so few friends in this alien land. She felt so lonely, so helpless. She dreaded making enemies. It was but the lull before the storm. When the study door had closed behind the two men, Mr. Montfort dropped his pleasant, careless manner, and faced Mr. Pollock with an anxious face. Pollock, he began abruptly, I'm worried. "'What about?' asked Pollock, turning from the window, where he seemed to be viewing the landscape. "'Have you heard the rumours about my wife being of African descent?' Montford asked, coming very close to Pollock, as though afraid the very air would hear him. "'There are threats, too, against my life because of my desire to free my slaves.' "'Nonsense!' exclaimed Pollock. "'I have heard the rumours about Mrs. Montford, but that is nothing, nothing but the malice of some malicious, jealous woman.' As for the threats against your life, how can you think of such things a second time? You are among the most chivalrous people on the face of the earth, who will protect you in your home. Montfort stood a moment before his friend, gazing at him earnestly, then he said, Pollock, if anything happens to me, I want you to promise me to help my wife and babies get back to Bermuda. Why, what can happen, man? You are nervous without a cause. In that safe, continued Montfort, not heeding the interruption, you will find money and deeds. Promise me that you will save them for my family. I promise, but it is all nonsense. I shall hold you to your promise, replied Montfort solemnly. The Committee on Public Safety generally met once a month. They had a chairman, but no one knew his identity save a chosen few of the committee. Indeed, very little was known positively as to the identity of any of the members. Certainly no one would ever have suspected the elegant Anson Pollock of being connected with such an organization. On this particular evening, Bill Sampson lounged by the Jefferson House on the lookout for some of his friends. Anson Pollock sat on the broad steps, evidently on the watch for someone, too. "'Hi, Bill,' he called, as the latter came in sight. "Hello." "'Want me?' returned Bill, and at a nod from his employer he followed him through the entrance to a small back room, generally used for meetings of the committee. "'Anything new for the committee to-night?' asked Pollock, as he lounged over the back of a chair. Bill took a seat on the edge of the table, and began cutting circles in the air with his rawhide. Bill Sampson was a character in his way. One could not imagine Newburn without Bill— and no one could possibly imagine Bill without his rawhide. "'Well, mabby, mabby. Depends on what you call work. Somebody,' with a sly glance at Pollock from beneath his bushy eyebrows, "'somebody's been circulating a report about a friend of yourn.' "'Well,' replied Pollock sharply, "'looks like we treat a possum show.' "'Well?' 
"'Somebody says how's Montfort's slaves is working for part pay. "'Leastways, every mother's son of them will be free inside of five years. "'Anything else?' "'We kind of thought that'd do for a spell. "'He's done enough in that are to convict him and buy his halter. "'That'll do for one pint.' "'But that don't cover the case. "'What luck have you had in spreading the other report?' "'Well,' said Bill, as he shot a copious draught of tobacco-juice over the sanded floor, "'most the fellers think it a pity about Miss Montfort. "'Blamed nice woman. "'She's been mighty good to Jeff Peterson's family, "'and Jeff he feels mighty uncomfortable about hurtin' on her, "'durned if he don't.' "'You and Jeff want to do your duty,' replied Pollock. "'No matter about sentiment. "'Influence is great with certain people.' and if niggers are tolerated in any way, it will end in weakening the law, and then good-bye to our institutions. "'Course, course. We tend to do our duty, yes, sir, our whole duty. But it beats all nature about Miss Montfort. I knowed she was mixed the minute I seed her, but ain't enough to track tension.' He paused a moment, and then said with a sigh, "'Well, Captain, what's your orders?' Pollock saw that the man's sympathy was more than half enlisted on the woman's side, and with arch diplomacy changed his tactics. He handed Bill a cigar, saying, "'We may as well make ourselves comfortable,' and before the latter had fairly begun to enjoy the fragrant weed, had called for whiskey and was pressing him to help himself. Under its stimulating influence, Bill soon lost what slight scruples he had felt, and was as eager for the downfall of the unfortunate family as his patron. "'Well, Bill,' continued Pollock, "'the first thing to be done is to put Montford out of the way, and then it will be plain sailing. The next question is, who will do that job?' "'Reckon I know just the man. The man of the right spirit who will be glad to serve his country for a reasonable consideration. And that reminds me, how much of the property is to be reserved for you?' The boys may have what they can get of it. I don't care for any part of the spoils. All I want is the mother and the children. Just so. Well, now, seein's I understand the case just as you want it, I'll lay low, set the boys on. You keep shady and stand ready the minute the mine's fired. I ain't got a cuss again Monsford myself, but the institution must be respected. Sure there's plenty of whiskey and stuff in the cellar? "'Twould look kind of mean in Montfort not to have a full cellar. "'It's a big job, and the boys'll be thirsty.' "'With this the two worthies arose from their seats, "'and sauntered through the door and up to the bar. "'A day or two after the foregoing, "'Hank Davis, true to his word, "'formally applied to Mr. Montfort "'for the position of overseer on his plantation. "'What made you think that I wanted an overseer?' asked Montfort as he pushed his hat off his face a little further, and eyed the petitioner critically, mentally vowing that he would never place even a horse in the power of such an ill-favored, beastly-looking fellow. "'Well, most southern gentlemen don't care to have a nigger overseer. It spiles em. They gives themselves airs and get sot up in their ideas. Thought maybe you, being a stranger, mightn't know our ways. You see, it's just here—' We have certain rules in this community that we all must bide by if we want to avoid trouble. As Hank ventured this last remark in a cautious manner, he scraped the gravel of the walk with one foot, while he slyly noted the reception of his venture by an upward cast of the eye. Charles Montfort looked at him a moment with a slumbering wrath, before he asked with dangerous coolness, "'What do I understand by what you have just said, Mr. Davis?' Do you mean to insinuate that a man cannot do as he will with his own property? Well, no, not exactly, but it's just here yeah, to speak plainly as tween friends, replied Hank, as he shifted his tobacco to the other side of his mouth. The plain fact is, I want the job of driving your niggers, and you'll want to keep the community friendly to your now it's got out that you're a-gwine to set the gang free by and by. Charles Montfort possessed one characteristic of the West Indian to a marked degree, and that was a bad temper under just provocation. Without more ado he seized the offending Hank by the collar, and with his riding-whip which he carried in his hand he administered a sound flogging to the offender. As he released him he said, 
"'When you leave my grounds, don't you ever set your foot inside the gates again, or it will be the worse for you.' Hank said nothing as he raised himself from the ground where the irate man had thrown him. But as he turned to leave the place he looked at Mr. Montfort, and even in his wrath at the insolence of such a mongrel cur as he mentally styled Davis, Charles Montfort felt a shudder of real physical fear pass over him for a moment. Surprised at himself, he turned to enter the house, dismissing the whole incident as a piece of impudence which he had done well to chastise. Taking it all in all, Mr. Montfort was not feeling very happy on this June morning, as he sat upon the piazza thinking over the late encounter. An hour passed swiftly away. Still the master of the house continued his meditations, but now he had changed his seat for a thoughtful promenade up and down the broad piazza. Finally he said softly to himself, "'Yes, that is just what I'll do. I'll send Gracie and the little fellows home for a while on a visit, and there they shall stay until I know just what the trouble is here about the slaves, and certain insinuations concerning my family are cleared up. When a man makes up his mind that he has solved a difficult problem that has worried him, he generally has an air of relief which is the more pathetic, that in nine cases out of ten he does not believe that his remedy will prove effective, although he fancies that he so believes. When Hank Davis left Mr. Montfort, he moved slowly down the sun-baked road, nursing his wrath and swearing vengeance. Nothing but the life of the man who had inflicted such an insult upon him could wipe it out. He had received the same treatment that he had given hundreds of his associates, until his name and presence had become a terror in the county where he resided. Hitherto he had given his orders and they had been obeyed. But here was a man, a comparative stranger, for whom he considered that he had been willing to do a great kindness for a consideration and not only had he met with a refusal of his request, but at the same time had received personal violence of a character that was most galling to the spirit of any free-born southern man, an ordinary cow-hiding such as he would mete out to his slave. As he thought more and more about the matter, he grew more and more filled with a desire for vengeance, not the ordinary kind, but something extraordinary." As he gradually turned over in his mind schemes for the undoing of the Montforts, he was accosted by the voice of Bill Sampson, calling to him from across the fields. Bill was overseeing the harvesting of a great field of cotton, and the voices of the slaves could be heard drawing out their weird and plaintive notes as they sought by song movement to lighten the monotony of their heavy tasks and to bring solace to their sad hearts. Some, in their simple ignorance, may not have known why they were sad, but, like the captive bird, their hearts longed for that which was ever the birthright of man, property in himself. Crushed out of sight for many years, the seed of all desire for all those things which make a man and sweeten toil was struggling ever toward the light of civilization denied to these poor, ignorant, enslaved souls. Hank sat down on a log by the wayside, and he beckoned Bill over to him. The latter came slowly across the field, and seated himself astride one end of the log. "'Howdy, Hank.' "'Howdy, Bill,' passed in greeting between the two cronies. "'Pears like to me, Hank, you're lookin' pale,' remarked Bill, as he trailed his whip backward and forward in the dust. Hank could stand it no longer and with a terrible imprecation he unfolded to his friend his tale of woe and insult. Bill listened with eager curiosity, and a satisfied knowing look might have been seen to settle about the corners of his eyes and mouth. "'Well, well,' said he, "'these are great times when a damned West Indy half-white nigger can raise his hand agin a white man. Be you hurt much, Hank?' "'Some in my body, but more in my feelings.' "'What are we a-comin' to? "'I tell you, Hank, it's about time something was done.' "'That's all well enough to talk,' replied Hank. "'But what can a man do agin the money that that feller's got to back him up? "'I can't see a handle on him.' "'Well,' replied Bill, "'I can.' "'You can?' exclaimed Hank, while a slow smile of derision covered his face. "'Well, I'd just like to know how.' 
"'Yer can laugh, Hank Davis, but it's a fact. "'Tain't going to be no hard job nother to get all that money, "'all them purty trinkets and fine furniture, "'and the seven hundred niggers in our pockets, if—' "'And here he paused, as though to give emphasis to his words, "'if we works the thing right.' "'Damn it all, man, why don't you let out?' as he rose excitedly from his seat on the log. "'I'm the man to help on anything again, that man, and yer knows it. No need of your being so infernal aggravating about telling me.' Bill laughed at his companion's excitement. "'Easy thar, easy, Hank. This are a mighty ticklish job, and we can work it. We can work it. First place, you see, Montfort's brought them slays of his and yah, and don't tend to keep em only about ten years.' and then every one of them will have bought itself, according to the laws that are governing them over to the West Indies. Now, you know there's a bad example to set before the niggers round this town. Anyway, we's going to think so, drawled Bill with an expressive wink at his friend. It's a law of the United States that if any man is caught creating dissatisfaction among the slaves, he dissolves death, and death he gets. Now, this our Montfort has been causing trouble for us by his example." Every nigger round here knows all about his arrangements for giving his slaves their freedom, and I tell you, Hank, it's causing dissatisfaction among all our slaves. And then the money, honey, the money. Such sights of it all done up in little chamois skin bags, and that boy Jesse sitting on the floor amusing himself building houses with them gold eagles. Hank listened to his companion's words with open mouth. As the latter finished, he said, with a look of admiration, "'Well, I'll be damned. Now look a here, Bill Sampson. You needn't tell me that all that you have just unfolded to me is your own ideas, cause you could no more have got them thoughts through your thick head than I could. Someone's been fixin' you up. Out with it now, and tell me the whole thing. If we's goin' into this business, we's got to be square on the deal with our friends. Who's the bottom of this thing?' Bill produced a plug of tobacco, offered his friend a chew, and took one himself. "'What I'm telling you, Hank, is tween friends,' said he, chewing and crossing his legs. "'Just so,' replied Hank. "'I was telling you the originator of this plan, or I was about to,' Bill paused to spit out some of his tobacco juice on the ground, so that it would not overflow the tank, so to speak, and run out of each corner of his mouth." "'Beats all nature, Hank, how a man'll get dead set on to a piece of caliker. "'Meanin' by that, Bill, that Aunt's Pollock's got set on some gal?' "'Fact,' said Bill, with a wink. "'Whose?' asked Hank. "'It won't be Miss Montford herself, Hank.' "'Sho, you don't say really,' said Hank, with a wicked look. "'Don't blame him, blamed if I do. "'But that's all the good that'll do him.' Bill cut the air into imaginary circles with his whip, and, without taking any notice of his friend, continued, "'As I was a-sayin', Aunt's Pollock, he says to me, "'Bill, that's a deuced purty woman of Montfort's, and I told him what I thought about her having black blood in her somewhere. "'Mabby,' says he, "'mabby,' and then he says, kind of generous-like, I'd take the woman and two brats, and the two boys might have the slaves and the money and the fixin's in the house. I told them the boys would stand by him and anything he might do to rid a peaceful neighborhood of such a disturbin' critter as Montfort. I told them I thought yer would be about the very match to light on Montfort, so he wouldn't give us any more trouble. And so we've been waitin' for the business to develop itself good and ripe. "'And I just think this tack of Montfort's on you "'will do about the business for the whole of them.' "'Bill,' said Hank Davis, as he held out his hand to his friend, "'we allers been partners, and I reckon we allers will be.'" End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of Contending Forces » by Pauline E. Hopkins this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4. The Tragedy Thus man devotes his brother, and destroys him, and worse than all, and most to be deplored, chains him, and tasks him, and exacts his sweat, with stripes that mercy, with a bleeding heart, weeps when she sees inflicted on a beast. Cowper Kismet says the Oriental, when unaccountable evil besets his path. 
It is fate, says the Anglo-Saxon, under like circumstances. But fate is the will of providence, after all. Nature avenges herself upon us, for every law violated in the mad rush for wealth or position or personal comfort where the rights of others of the human family are not respected. If Charles Montfort had been contented to accept the rulings of the English Parliament, and had allowed his human property to come under the new laws just made for its government, although poorer in the end, he would have spared himself and his family all the horrors which were to follow his selfish flight to save that property. The sun rose clear and resplendent a few mornings later. On this particular morning nature outdid herself. There was a blending together of all the sweet forces, odorous air, golden sunshine, musical sounds from bird and from bush. It was pure happiness to feel the life-blood leaping in one's veins, to feel the marvellous joy of living. Eight o'clock was the usual breakfast hour for the Montforts. The family had just assembled at the table. Aunt Cindy had brought in the great silver coffee urn and placed it beside Mrs. Montfort. Mr. Montfort had settled himself in his chair with a weekly paper, for in this rural neighborhood a newspaper once in a week was a great luxury. When his attention was caught by the sound of hoof-beats of several horses on the road, Mrs. Montfort, with usual southern hospitality, looked over her well-appointed board to make sure that all was in order for dispensing those creature comforts so dear to the entertainer and the entertained. The hoof-beats drew nearer and paused on the graveled walk. Montfort hastened to the door, while Mrs. Montfort turned toward the entrance of the breakfast-room with a pleasant smile of welcome on her lips. She heard a number of voices speaking together in an excited jumble then a shot, followed by a heavy fall. Little Jesse ran from his station by his mother's side through one of the long windows opening upon the piazza. She heard his scream of, "'Papa! Papa!' and then again the jumble of excited voices. With little Charles clinging to her skirts, she stumbled blindly to the entrance and faced the crowd of angry men, headed by Anson Pollock. Hank Davis had done his work well and Charles Montfort lay dead with a bullet in his brain, sped by an unseen hand. Mrs. Montfort's arms were grasped by rude hands, and she was forcibly drawn out upon the veranda, where in the sunlight of the beautiful morning she saw the body of her husband lying face downward. She was dimly conscious of hearing the cries of frightened slaves mingled with the screams of her children. Through it all she realized but two things— that the lifeless object lying there so still was the body of her husband, and that the sensual face of Anson Pollock, whom she had grown to loathe and fear, was gloating over her agony, devilish in its triumph. Then she lost consciousness. As she lay upon the green sward, oblivious to thought and feeling, supported by her weeping maid, who had been ordered to care for her mistress by Mr. Pollock, Hank Davis came and stood for a moment looking down upon the unconscious woman. Suddenly an evil smile lighted up his countenance. He looked around, but saw nothing of Anson Pollock, who had disappeared within the house, searching for money and papers in the safe. Now was his time. This woman's husband had flogged him. He would have a sweet revenge. Those lily-like limbs— the tender flesh that had never known aught but the touch of love, should feel the lash as he had. He called to Bill Sampson to help lift her, and despite the prayers and tears of the poor slave-girl who followed her beloved mistress until Sampson knocked her senseless with the butt-end of his rawhide, they bore the hapless lady to the whipping-post. She revived as they reached the spot, and when she realized the fate in store for her, the sweet woman's strong soul failed her. She uttered a wild cry of agony as the rough hand of Hank Davis was laid upon her to tear her garments from her shrinking shoulders. "'Charles, my husband, save me!' she cried and fell fainting upon the ground. There was none to answer the heart-rending appeal." He, who would have shed his heart's best blood for her, 
lay cold in death. She was soon restored to consciousness, for Hank's savage instinct for revenge would only be appeased by the victim's full realization of her sufferings. She was bound to the whipping post as the victim to the stake, and lashed with rawhides alternately by the two strong, savage men. Hank Davis drew first blood by reason of his wrongs at Mr. Montfort's hands. With all his mighty strength he brought the lash down upon the frail and shrinking form. Oh, God! Was there none to rescue her? The air whistled as the snaky leather thong curled and writhed in its rapid, vengeful descent. A shriek from the victim, a spurt of blood that spattered the torturer, a long, raw gash across a tender, white back. Hank gazed at the cut with critical satisfaction, as he compared its depth with the skin and blood that encased the long, tapering lash. It was now Bill's turn. "'I'll go you one better,' he said, as he sighted the distance and exact place to make his mark with mathematical precision, at the same time shifting his tobacco from the right to the left cheek. Again the rawhide whistled through the air, falling across the other cut squarely in the center. Another shriek, a stifled sob, a long-drawn quivering sigh, then the deep stillness of unconsciousness. Again and again was the outrage repeated. Fainting fit followed fainting fit. The blood stood in a pool about her feet. When Hank Davis had satiated his vengeful thirst, he cut the ropes which bound her and she sank upon the ground again, unconscious, bleeding, friendless, alone. Lucy had hidden in the smoke-house with the two children, that they might not witness their mother's agony. Meantime the Committee on Public Safety, instigated by Anson Pollock to put down an imaginary insurrection, having no existence but in his own mind, and supposed to have originated with the slaves of Charles Montfort, and to legalize the looting of the house, took possession of the mansion. Soon the crowd had stripped it of its furniture and all the articles of value. The house itself was fired, and Grace Montfort again became conscious of her misery in time to see the dead body of her husband flung amid the burning rafters of his dwelling. Two and two the slaves were handcuffed together to be driven to the market-place. Mrs. Montfort, secured to her maid, was placed in a wagon with her two children, and so the miserable woman was driven away from her outraged home. In those old days, if accused of aiding slaves in a revolt, a white man stood no more chance than a negro accused of the same crime. He forfeited life and property. This power of the law Anson Pollock had invoked, and, to add to the devilishness of the plot, had used Bill Sampson's suggestion of black blood in Mrs. Montfort to further his scheme for possessing the beautiful woman. So the two children and their mother fell to the lot of Anson Pollock as his portion of the spoils. Shortly after these events, Grace Montfort disappeared and was never seen again. The waters of Pamlico Sound tell of sweet oblivion for the broken-hearted found within their soft embrace. After the loss of their mother, the two lads clung very closely to each other. So many changes had come to them. Such desperate bloody scenes had dazed their brains and terrified them, that even the loss of their mother seemed but in keeping with the rest. Bewilderment at so much sorrow, the numbness of black despair was ever with them. Pollock's rage was terrible when he learned that Mrs. Montfort had destroyed herself. He grew morose and unsociable, so that his society was no longer sought in the county. He seemed to have a superstitious fear of the children, and for a long time would not tolerate them in his presence. It was common talk among the slaves that Mrs. Montfort walked, weeping and wringing her hands, night after night about the plantation. But wonder could go no farther when Pollock elected to take Lucy in the place he had designed for Mrs. Montfort. God's mysteries are past man's understanding, and thus the poor black girl became his instrument to temper the wind to the shorn lambs. 
Night after night she stole away to the little attic under the eaves, laden with dainties to tempt the appetite of the children. For hours she would sit hushing Jessie's sobs upon her ample breast, and speaking words of comfort in her poor, blind way to Charles. When a year had dragged its slow length past, a stranger in the town stopped Bill Sampson on the street one day, and asked him if he knew where he could hire a likely boy to go with him into the woods for a few days, and help arrange specimens of the quartz in that locality. He was looking up the minerals in that section for speculators, he said. Bill promised to get him a boy, and asked Pollock's permission for Charles to go with the men. "'I don't care what you do with him. Only keep him away from me. I'll sell him south soon,' said Pollock. So it happened that Charles went every day for a month with the mineralogist. The lad's appearance, education, and refinement puzzled the man for a time, until he learned the tragic story. "'Charles,' said he a few weeks later, "'I am about to leave this part of the country. I don't want to leave you here. Do you think Mr. Pollock could be induced to part with you?' "'Oh, sir!' cried Charles, throwing himself at the gentleman's feet. "'For the love of God, buy me and my little brother. "'If you will only take us to Bermuda, someone there will pay you back. "'My father had money there. We have friends there. "'Oh, sir, for the love of God!' "'The man looked at the weeping boy as through a mist. "'He had a tender heart. "'I will tell you something, Charles,' he said kindly, "'as he raised the lad and drew him to a seat beside him on the grass, "'with his arm tenderly enfolding the child.' I am an Englishman, but it will not do to have that fact known here, for then I would be powerless to help you. Anson Pollock would never sell you to me if he knew that fact. I have been trying to buy you and Jessie, but Pollock wants to keep the boy for a valet. He intends to sell you south, you are too old to forget, and he fears you. Now I propose to buy you, and as soon as possible I shall take you to Bermuda, collect the proofs there concerning your family, and then go to England, invoke the power of home government, and demand Jessie's freedom and indemnity from the United States government for all the outrages perpetrated against your family. Can you keep this secret, and will you try and be patient until I can accomplish my purpose? "'I will do anything you say,' replied the boy humbly. "'But I hate to leave Jessie. "'Oh, Mama, Mama, my beautiful mamma! "'And with a burst of grief he cast himself upon the velvet turf. "'The mineralogist lost no time in completing the purchase of Charles, "'and in a few days they left the town. "'Then little Jessie, the petted darling of a luxurious home, found himself alone in the power of Anson Pollock. He must wait upon him obsequiously by day, and be ready to answer his call at any hour of the night. Under his enemy's eye, by day and night, hopeless, utterly alone upon the wide waste of waters which represented his life. Oh, how black, boundless, trackless, was the unknown future to this unfortunate child! Once, after his brother was sold, he resisted his master, rebelled with all his puny strength. He was severely flogged. That night he slept in the lonely cabin, kept as a sort of prison for refractory slaves. Not a sigh disturbed the silence of the night as he lay in pain, gazing up at the stars which shone so peacefully through the dilapidated roof. He thought himself delirious, or was it indeed possible that God had taken compassion on his loneliness and allowed the comfort and help of communion with the dead? He saw his murdered father and mother. Hand in hand they passed and repassed over the gaping holes in the roof of the hut. His father's noble loving face smiled upon him. His mother's curls moved in the faint breeze, while her loving glance seemed to say, Courage! courage, we are ever near you. Father, Grace, speak to me, he shrieked in agony. Then he seemed to feel their actual presence, tangible through the viewless, beside him in the hut. Calmness came to him, and a change grand to see in that slight frame. Unconsciously he asked the question, 
How long must I endure before I join you in heaven? It seemed to him that he was answered. Many days and even years, but fear not, we will never leave thee. After that night Jesse's childhood appeared to slip from him, and he became a man in thought. He studied his master, and matched low cunning with lofty determination. He rebelled no more, was silent, not provoking Anson Pollock's wrath. The time seemed long and dreary, waiting for the freedom he resolved to have. Still, he was patient. Sometimes at night, when rolled in his blanket on the hard floor, he would weep over the painful past. Then he would feel the touch of a tiny hand upon his eyelids. It was his mother's hand. He knew it to be so. Then he would lose himself in sweet dreams, and awaken in the morning refreshed and comforted. So the years rolled on until he was sixteen. Meantime, nothing was heard from Charles and his supposed friend. Jesse had made up his mind that Charles was either dead or else lost to him forever. Jesse was now a man in stature, though still slender, with the same haughty bearing and distinguished appearance that had marked his father. Anson Pollock, upon whom age and the memory of dreadful crimes were making fearful inroads, began to look up to the boy and lean upon him for aid in his various plans for making money. He had spoken to him of making him the overseer in place of Bill Sampson, and had even hinted at his taking a mate. Then Jesse knew that his probation was nearly over. That spring Pollock, as was the common practice among planters, made out passes for Jesse and sent him to New York in charge of a vessel filled with produce, and charged to bring back necessary merchandise for use on the plantation. Pollock thought the boy still too young to venture to leave him. Indeed, Jesse had no such idea when he started on his trip to the north. When the vessel reached New York, Jesse performed all the necessary duties, disposed of the produce, and reloaded the ship for its homeward voyage. The night before they were to sail, he sat on the wharf watching the crews of the other vessels making ready for departure. His mind was engrossed with thoughts of Charles. He feared some evil had befallen him. At any rate, he said to himself, I shall never see him again. And must I remain in servitude? Can I do nothing to help myself, since all hope is gone in that direction? Just then a group of men paused in front of him. They did not know he was a slave. "'Will you give passage to two on board your vessel? You're bound to Newburn in the morning, aren't you? We'll pay you what you charge,' said one of the group respectfully. "'Speak to the captain,' called out a man standing near. "'That's nothing but a nigger you're talking to.' Well, said the one who had first addressed him, you're a likely boy anyhow. Who do you belong to? Jesse arose from his seat, white with passion, and said to the man, I am no man's property. I belong to Jesus Christ. The question had answered itself. When the vessel sailed the next morning, Jesse was far on his road to Boston. Traveling then was done by stage, and was a slow process but about a week later he stood beside the stone wall that enclosed the historic Boston Common, and as he watched the cows chewing their peaceful cuds and inhaled the deep draughts of freedom's air, he vowed to die rather than return to Anson Pollock. He found work in Boston. It mattered not that it was mental work. He was happy. But fate or providence was not done with him yet. One day he received word that Anson Pollock was on his way to Boston in search of him. Again he made a hurried journey, this time to Exeter, New Hampshire. In his character of a fugitive slave, the lad had from the first cast his lot with the colored people of the community, and when he left Boston he was directed to see Mr. Whitfield, a negro in Exeter who could and would help the fugitive. Late one afternoon, just before tea-time, a comely black woman stood in her long, low-raftered kitchen preparing supper before the open fireplace. There was every indication of plenty in the homely furnishings. 
As the woman passed rapidly from the cupboard to the table, she would touch with her foot the rockers of the little red cradle which stood in the center of the floor. The baby in it was crying in a fretful way. "'Oh, hush, Lizzie,' said the mother. "'Don't be so cross.' There came a low rap at the open door, and, in answer to her come in, Jessie stepped into the room. "'Is Mr. Whitfield in?' he asked, as he doffed his hat respectfully. "'No,' was the reply. "'But I expect him every minute. Sit down, won't you? He'll soon be into his supper, I guess.' Mrs. Whitfield thought him a white man, come on business with her husband. "'A handsome lad,' she thought. Jessie seated himself and then, as the child continued to cry, said, "'Shall I rock the cradle for you, ma'am? The child seems fretful.'" Fifteen years later, Jesse married Elizabeth Whitfield, the baby he had rocked to sleep the first night of his arrival in Exeter. By her he had a large family. Thus he was absorbed into that unfortunate race, of whom it is said that a man had better be born dead than to come into the world as part and parcel of it. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Contending Forces by Pauline E. Hopkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Five Moss Smith's Lodging House. Let not ambition mock their useful toil, their homely joys and destiny obscure, not grandeur here with a disdainful smile the short and simple annals of the poor. Gray. "'Thank heaven that is done,' said Dora, as she sat down wearily in her mother's large rocker in the cosy kitchen. She had been upstairs the best portion of the day preparing the room for an expected lodger. There had been windows to wash, paint to clean, a carpet to tack down, curtains to hang, and furniture to place in position. In short, the thousand and one things to do that are essential to the comfort of the lodger and the good reputation of the house. "'Are you very tired, daughter?' queried her mother, as she glanced with loving pride at the graceful figure before her, at the smooth bands of dark brown hair, now a little ruffled and disordered, and at the delicate brown face, now somewhat puckered and out of sorts from weariness. "'Well, not very tired, mummy dear.' Only this continual scrub and dig is not always the cheerful work we would like to think it. Still, I don't care as long as the house pays. The mother sighed as she asked, Did you give her the front or back square? Oh, I gave her the front square after all. She's too beautiful for that dreary back room. I know that it is not business to let a good paying room go under our usual price, but she's a steady. She has the best of references. Father Andrew gives her the best of characters, and so I'll chance getting my money back out of the next cross-grained old bachelor who comes along. See how mercenary I am getting to be, since I undertook to direct the fortunes of a lodging-house? And with a gay laugh the daughter jumped from her seat, every trace of fatigue gone, and grasping her mother about the waist, whirled her around the room to the accompaniment of a sweet, shrill whistle of the latest popular waltz. In the midst of the frolic there came a loud ring of the door-bell, and placing her panting and protesting mother in the rocker just vacated, she vanished, and soon her voice was heard above, as she directed the placing of the luggage of the expected lodger. The Smith family consisted of the mother, daughter, and son. A few years before the opening of our story the father had died, leaving a delicate wife, a young daughter, and a son just ready to enter college also a house in a respectable part of the south end of Boston, Massachusetts, with a heavy mortgage upon it. Like many colored men living in large cities, his life had been a continual struggle with poverty and hard work, combined with a desire for advancement for his children, and a clean, self-respecting citizenship for himself. Smith was a free-born southern negro, a Virginian. His father had bought himself and married a free woman. After the birth of Henry, his mother died, and when his father married again, his aunts brought him to the city of New Bedford, where he had imbibed, along with copious draughts of salt air, 
an unwavering desire for all the blessings of liberty, and strong notions that a man must depend on himself in great measure, and carve out his own fortune to the best of his ability, with such tools as God had furnished him. Henry Smith's early manhood was spent upon the sea, and when at last he settled in Boston, he could converse about foreign ports and countries with the ease and familiarity of personal knowledge. Possessed of very little education, yet he concealed the fact admirably under a naturally intelligent manner. Soon after he ceased to follow the sea, he married a handsome mulattress from New Hampshire, and with her help saved a small sum of money, enough to make the first payment on a home, and then began the struggle of their lives. The masses of the negro race find for employment only the most laborious work at the scantiest remuneration. A man, though a skilled mechanic, has the door of the shop closed in his face here among the descendants of the liberty-loving Puritans. The foreign element who come to the shores of America soon learn that there is a class which is called its inferior, and will not work in this or that business if niggers are hired, and the master or owner, being neither able nor willing to secure enough of the despised class to fill the places of the white laborers, acquiesces in the general demand, and the poor negro finds himself banned in almost every kind of employment. Henry Smith had his ambitions, but, like all of his meek race, he would not, or at least had no desire to, contend with the force of prejudice, and quietly took up his little business of repairing old clothes in the same patient spirit of the Jew old clove vendor or pawnbroker. Two children were born to this worthy couple, William Jesse Montfort and Dora Grace Montfort. When Willie was seventeen and Dora twelve, their father sickened and died. Thenceforth the burden of the support of the little family fell upon the mother. Willie was preparing to enter college, but he cheerfully gave up his plans and secured a place as a bellboy in one of the fashionable hostelries with which Boston abounds, and soon by his attention to business, his gentlemanly manners, and intelligent understanding of all that was required of him, he made himself invaluable to his employers. Twenty dollars a month with board and tips was a very respectable showing for a lad of seventeen, and Willie felt himself repaid when he saw the great help and comfort his small earnings gave to his dear mother. Dora was kept at her studies until she was graduated from the high school. Meantime, Mrs. Smith, or Ma Smith, as she was called by the young people of her acquaintance, increased their income by letting furnished rooms. The mother and daughter shared the same sleeping room, and Will declared himself in favor of an attic chamber as being the least desirable for renting purposes. There he established himself in a very comfortable nest, furnished after the fashion dear to all young fellows' hearts, with everything handy. The only occasions upon which Will and Dora were known to quarrel were the weekly cleaning days, when the latter would insist on tidying up Will's room. Then shoes were moved from the mantel, and the blacking brushes from the top of the dressing-case, collars, cuffs, and ties were placed in their proper receptacles, and garments hung in the clothes-press. Then Will would scold a good deal, because he couldn't find things. But by the next morning he would have them handy again. Many lodgers were obtained through Will's acquaintance with young men at the hotel where he worked, and very soon the mother was able to see that the debt upon the home which she hoped to leave to her children was slowly but surely disappearing. Deep in her heart was the cherished hope that when the mortgage was paid Willie would be free to choose a profession, but they never mentioned among themselves the hope which was cherished in each breast. As the years rolled slowly by, the children saw that their mother could do not so much as formerly and so by degrees, after Dora had finished school, the burden of the care of the house fell upon her strong young shoulders, and 1896 found her taking full charge and proving herself to be a woman of ability and the best of managers, husbanding their small income to the best advantage. With about every avenue for business closed against them, 
It is surprising that so many families of color manage to live as well as they do, and to educate their children and give them a few of the refinements of living, such as cultivating a musical talent, gratifying a penchant for languages, or for carving, or for any of the arts of a higher civilization so common among the whites, but supposed to be beyond the reach of a race just released from a degrading bondage. Whatever grace or accomplishment may be the order of the hour, it is copied or practiced among some portion of the colored population. We may well ask ourselves how this is done. Among the white Americans who perform domestic or personal service, how rare it is to meet the brilliant genius of a Frederick Douglass. But with this people it is a common occurrence to find a genius in a profession, trade, or invention, evolved from the rude nurturing received at the hands of a poor father and mother engaged in the lowliest of service, who see not the nobility of their sacrifices in the delight afforded them in watching the unfolding of the bud of promise in their offspring. From the bosom of the earth we take the diamond, pearls from the depth of the sea, from the lowliest walks of life we cull the hope of a future life beyond the perplexing questions of this present existence. Why should we wonder or question, then, when we see the steady advance of a race overriding the barriers set by prejudice and injustice? Man has said that from lack of means and social caste the negro shall remain in a position of serfdom all his days. But the mighty working of cause and effect, the mighty unexpected results of the law of evolution, seem to point to a different solution of the negro question than any worked out by the most fertile brain of the highly cultured Caucasian. Then again we do not allow for the infusion of white blood which became pretty generally distributed in the inferior black race during the existence of slavery. Some of this blood, too, was the best in the country. Combinations of plants or trees, or of any productive living thing, sometimes generate rare specimens of the plant or tree. Why not, then, of the genus Homo? Surely the negro race must be productive of some valuable specimens, if only from the infusion which amalgamation with a superior race must eventually bring. This is a mighty question. Today, with all the heated discussions of tariff reform, the parity of gold and silver, the hoarding of giant sums of money by trusts and combinations, still the negro question will not down. It is the most important, the mightiest in the land, and is quietly assuming greater proportions as it forges its way to the front to take its place shortly as the gravest question in the councils of the nation. When Dora returned to the kitchen, her mother had about finished the preparations for supper. The short winter afternoon had dropped into early twilight. Every alternate night was Will Smith's early night home from the hotel, and the little family always managed to have an inviting tea and to pass a cheerful evening together. Lately another person had attached himself to the Smiths. A fellow waiter with Will had finally worked himself into the profession of law, and having established himself in the business in a downtown office, had put his admiration for Dora into words, and it was understood that in due course of time they would marry. Dora lighted the lamps, drew the curtains, and looked about the cozy kitchen with a satisfaction which might well be pardoned, for even in palatial homes a more inviting nest could not be found. The table was carefully spread with a nicely ironed cloth of spotless white, red-bordered napkins lay at each plate, a good quality of plated silverware mingled with the plain, inexpensive whiteware in which the meal was to be served. Ma Smith, in her neat calico dress and long white apron, busied herself in the making of tea and coffee, and seeing that the delicate muffins were browned to just the right turn, while Dora busied herself in putting the finishing touches to a house-dress for her mother. "'Well, Dora,' said her mother, as she bustled about the room, "'does the young woman seem pleased with your arrangements? I'm sure she ought to, after all the labor you spent on that room.' She says she is greatly pleased with everything. Say, Ma, she's got a typewriter, and she says she picks up a good living at home with it. Talk about your beauties. My, but she's the prettiest creature I ever saw. I expect all the men in this house will be crazy over her. 
"'Yes, dear,' replied her mother with a quiet laugh. "'You don't want John making eyes at her, do you?' Dora laughed as she said, "'I'd just drop John P. Langley if I thought he admired any woman more than he did me. "'But really, Ma, you won't be able to keep from loving her. "'She has the sweetest and saddest face I ever saw. "'I have read of the woman with a story written on her face, "'but I never believed it anything but a fairy tale.' "'You'll believe me when you see her and talk with her.' "'There are the boys,' said her mother, as the sound of voices reached their ears, together with the closing of the front door, and great stamping of feet to brush away the snow. The next moment the door opened, and two young men entered the cheerful room, and with jest and laugh bade the two women good evening. Will Smith was tall and finely formed, with features almost perfectly chiseled, and a complexion the color of an almond shell. His hair was black and curly, with just a tinge of crispness to denote the existence of negro blood. His eyes were dark and piercing as an eagle's. Ladies of high position followed his tall form with admiring glances as he moved about his duties at the hotel, and wondered that so much manly beauty should be wasted on an inferior race. John Langley, his companion, was shorter in stature and very fair in complexion. His hair was dark and had no indication of negro blood in its waves. His features were of the Caucasian cut. He possessed a gentle refinement of manner, apt to take well with the opposite sex, but to a reader of character the strong manhood and honesty of purpose which existed in Will Smith were lacking in John Langley. He was a North Carolinian a descendant of slaves and southern crackers. We might call this a bad mixture, the combination of the worst features of a dominant race with an enslaved race, and in some measure John Langley would bear out the unfavorable supposition upon close acquaintance. Many of his young friends did not care for him, because he developed a revengeful trait of character. He liked his ease, and enjoyed indulging himself in every luxury that his modest means would allow. He had, moreover, a carefully concealed strain of sensuality in his nature, which as yet had never been aroused to an overindulgence in illegitimate and questionable pleasures, and with it all he had a mercenary streak, which made love of money his great passion. He possessed great political acumen, and was strong in debate, which attracted a certain class of politicians around him. These attributes, combined with the practice of his profession, might eventually make or mar his fortunes in the untried future that stretched before him. Seated at the pleasant tea-table, the gay laugh and jolly joke went round, and even Ma Smith forgot her years and contributed her share of mirth to the general good time. "'Talk about funny things happening,' said Ma Smith. "'Your grandfather, Will, was a comical genius. "'You know that I have told you there were fourteen in our family, "'all girls, and very near each other in age. "'When your aunts, Fanny and Lottie, began to receive company, "'there was a great time to keep it from father for a while. "'Mother was heart and hand with the girls "'and wanted to see them have a pleasant time, "'but father did not like it.' Your grandfather worked hard, and at night was very tired, so the dear old man would go to bed soon after his supper and pipe. Then was the girls' time. A fire was made in the parlor, which was at the front of the house, a good distance away from father's room, and by the time the young man arrived to make his call, the old gentleman was generally sound asleep. One night, however, things did not work so well. In those days we had large open fireplaces. Stoves did not come in until I was about five years old. I can see that low-sealed parlor now, with its brick hearth and brass andirons holding the glowing logs, the flames crackling and shooting upward, the firelight dancing and shining on the little cupboard doors on each side of the chimney. There was a rag carpet on the floor. Your grandmother made her own carpets from rags and our floors were covered with large hand-made rag-rugs, for no housekeeper was counted much who did not have a large supply of such things. There were china figures on the mantel, and vases filled with golden rod gathered the summer before. The furniture was mahogany, polished until you could see your face in any part of it. 
There was a red cloth on the table which stood between the two windows, and in the center of it was a large astral lamp trimmed about the edges with long crystal pendants, which we children called diamonds. We thought nothing could be more elegant than that lamp. It was a wedding present to your grandmother. Did you have kerosene in those days, Ma? asked Dora. Lord bless you, no. We burned whale oil or sperm oil in that lamp. Poor people used candles. Your grandmother used to save her fat and clarify it and mix it with beeswax to harden it, and we made our candles every week as regularly as we did the family cooking. Sometimes there was a danger of the supply of oil giving out in the stores, and then oil cost a great deal of money. That never lasted long, however, and in a few weeks some new Bedford whaler would be in port with a large cargo of whale oil, and then there would be a big supply selling cheap. I don't see how you got along without stoves and things, observed Dora. Baking day must have been a terror. We had tin kitchens and Dutch ovens. We never had any trouble. What's a tin kitchen? asked John. It's an oven made of tin for roasting meat. It stood on four legs, about a foot from the floor, and had a place for charcoal fire at the back, and a chimney to carry off the smoke. The front fastened by a hasp to the back, and could be let down to put the food in on the little grate inside. It was a very convenient arrangement, and I wish I had one this minute. A Dutch oven was very much like our iron kettles, which we use for boiling. There was a grate inside to hold the food. It must have been a great nuisance keeping house under such circumstances. Well, what became of the young man that particular evening, Ma? chimed in Will. This night father was restless and did not retire with his usual promptness, and we had only just got him out of the way when the expected caller arrived. However, everything went on very well, and you may be sure that there was much peeping and giggling on the part of the half grown sisters, who were denied the great privilege of the parlor and company as yet. Your grandmother sat in the kitchen knitting and trying to keep the younger children in order, when to her consternation the door opened and in walked father. Elizabeth, said he, I hear a man's voice in the parlor. What's the trouble? Poor mother tried to explain, and murmured something about a gentleman calling on Fanny. A man, roared father, calling on my daughter. And the first thing we knew, he seized the bucket of water from the kitchen dresser, we had wells in those days, and a bucket of water always stood on the dresser, and started for the parlor and flung the door open. Without speaking to the astonished occupants of the room, he stalked to the fireplace and deliberately poured the water upon the blazing wood, and then he turned to the caller and said, Young man, if you have a home, go to it. This is no halfway house for the accommodation of young squirts. Fanny, he said, turning to your aunt, you go to bed and don't let this thing occur again. The young man left as quickly as possible and poor Fanny retired to her room greatly mortified. "'That's good discipline for girls,' said John, with a laugh. "'If we had more fathers after that stamp, we fellows would get better wives.' "'And we girls better husbands,' chimed in Dora. "'Still, I pity poor Aunt Fanny.' "'The fellow wasn't much or he'd have stuck, and not been driven off that way. "'I'd have made the old gentleman like me in spite of himself if I had meant business,' said Will." "'Oh, by the by, did your new lodger come, Dora?' "'Yes, and Will, I never met anyone so beautiful in all my life. You'll be fascinated when you meet her.' "'That's you all over, Dora. All your swans generally turn out geese. I'll bet you a new pair of Easter gloves that she's a rank old maid with false teeth, bald head, hair on her upper lip. All right, Will Smith, all right. Just wait until you see her.' I'll wager a new pair of embroidered silk suspenders that your head and ears in love with her long before that time. I'll hold the stakes, cried John. They rose from the table, and John said with a tender glance at Dora, I thought someone would enjoy seeing the old homestead. It's at the Boston Theatre tonight. Don't you want to go, Dora? Dora's eyes sparkled as he held the two tickets before her. "'Get your things on, Dora. You've just time to reach the theatre before the curtain rises,' said her brother. In a little while the house was quiet, 
and the mother and son settled down to the enjoyment of a quiet evening together. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of Contending Forces by Pauline E. Hopkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Six Ma Smith's Lodging House Concluded. The gray day darkened into night, made hoary with a swarm, and whirl dance of the blinding storm, as zigzag wavering to and fro, crossed and recrossed the winged snow. William. February drew slowly to a close. Boston had lain for the past three or four days in the grasp of the Snow King. At number 500 D Street, each tenant seemed content to keep within the bounds of his or her small domain, literally froze up, as Mrs. Ophelia Davis expressed it. No one had seen much of the new lodger. She passed in and out each morning with a package of work in her hand, and all day long, from nine in the morning until late at night sometimes, the click of the typewriter could be heard coming from the first front square, which, interpreted, meant the front room on the second floor. Dora had been very neighborly, and had called on Miss Clark frequently. There was a great fascination for her about the quiet, self-possessed woman. She did not, as a rule, care much for girl friendships, holding that a close intimacy between two of the same sex was more than likely to end disastrously for one or the other. But Sappho Clark seemed to fill a long-felt want in her life, and she had from the first a perfect trust in the beautiful girl. Mrs. Smith had furnished her rooms substantially and well, but there had been no attempt at decoration. The first time Dora entered the room after Sappho had settled herself in it, she was struck at the alteration in its appearance. The iron bedstead and the washing utensils were completely hidden by drapery curtains of a dark blue denim, beautifully embroidered in white floss. A cover of the same material was thrown over the small table between the windows. Plain white muslin draperies hid the unsightly but serviceable yellow shades at the windows. Her desk and typewriter occupied the center of the room, and a couch had been improvised from two packing-cases and a spring, covered with denim and piled high with cushions. Two good steel engravings completed a very inviting interior. "'How pretty you have made it!' observed Dora, looking curiously around the room. Sappho came and stood beside her, and the two girls smiled at each other in a glow of mutual interest, and became fast friends at once. I always carry these things with me in my travels, and I find that I can make myself very comfortable in a short time with their help. "'I wish you could show me how to do this embroidery,' said Dora, as she lifted the edge of the denim curtain before the toilet stand and critically examined it. "'This is beautifully done. Where did you learn?' "'I will teach you with pleasure,' replied Sappho. But Dora noticed that she did not tell her where she had learned." "'Do you like your work? Is it hard?' asked Dora, as she idly wandered from one object to another in the pretty room, pausing beside the desk to glance admiringly at a pile of neatly written sheets just taken from the machine. "'Oh, I like the work very well. Sometimes the dictator is obtuse, or long-winded, or thinks that the writer ought to do his thinking for him as well as the corrections. Then it is not pleasant work, but— "'Generally speaking, I prefer it to most anything that I know of. "'Do sit down,' she continued, pushing a chair toward Dora. "'This man receiveth sinners,' read Dora from a pamphlet on the desk "'as she turned to accept the offered chair. "'I see that is your illuminated text for the day. "'Are you a Christian?' "'Then she saw an ivory crucifix suspended at the left side of the desk "'and stopped in some confusion.' Sappho dropped the dress she was mending, and for a moment her eyes took on the far-away look of one in deep thought. Finally she said, I saw you glance at the crucifix. I am not a Catholic, but I have received many benefits and kindnesses at their hands. Your question is a hard one to answer. I am afraid I am not a Christian, as we of our race understand the expression, but I try to do the best I can— and he who does the best he can need never fear the church's ban, 
nor hell's damnation. God recks not how man counts his beads, for righteousness is not in creeds, nor solemn faces, but rather lies in Christian deeds and Christian graces, quoted Dora softly. For my part I am sick of loud professions and constant hypocrisy. My religion is short and to the point. Feed the starving thief and make him an honest man. Cover your friend's faults with the mantle of charity and keep her in the path of virtue. Then you are not one of those who think that a woman should be condemned to eternal banishment for the sake of one misstep? Not I, indeed. I have always felt a great curiosity to know the reason why each individual woman loses character and standing in the eyes of the world. I believe that we would hang our heads in shame at having the temerity to judge a fallen sister, could we but know the circumstances attending many such cases. And, after all we may do or say, continued the girl softly, the best of us, who have lived the purest lives on earth that mortal can conceive, find at last that our only hope lies in the words of that text, This man receiveth sinners. You are a dear little preacher, said Sappho gently, as she looked at Dora from two wet eyes, and if our race ever amounts to anything in this world, it will be because such women as you are raised up to save us. Dora laughed and said, as she rose from her seat, I think I'm forgetting my errand, and making an elaborate bow, she continued, If it please your royal highness, I present to you the compliments of the occupants of number 500 D Street, with the request that you will honor us on Sunday evening, at half after seven, in the parlor of the worthy landlady of said house, where an informal reception will be held to further the better acquaintance of Miss Sappho Clark with her fellow occupants of said house. Music during the evening, refreshments at nine sharp, after which you are all expected to retire to your rooms like virtuous citizens. I herewith most gratefully accept your kind invitation, replied Sappho, with a deep courtesy. Ta-ta, then, until Sunday night. I shan't see you before that. I shall be lost for the remainder of the week getting ready for company, and Dora, with a gay laugh, ran lightly down the stairs. Mrs. Smith, after many trials, found that her house contained respectable, though unlettered people, who possessed kindly hearts and honesty of purpose in a greater degree than one generally finds in a lodging-house. Her great desire, then, was to make them as happy together as possible, and to this end she had Dora Institute musical evenings or reception nights, that her tenants might have a better opportunity of becoming acquainted with each other. She argued, logically enough, that those who were inclined to stray from right paths would be influenced either in favor of upright conduct, or else shamed into an acceptance of the right. It soon became noised about that very pleasant times were enjoyed in that house, and that a sick lodger had been nursed back to health, instead of being hustled into the hospital ambulance at the first sign of sickness. It was also whispered that to enjoy these privileges one must be pretty nice, or, as some expressed it, you've got to be high-toned to get in there. The result, however, justified Mrs. Smith's judgment, and rooms were always hard to get at No. 500 D Street. Saturday was a busy day for Dora and her mother. At these little gatherings Mrs. Smith always gave her guests plenty of good homemade cake, sandwiches, hot chocolate, and, on very special occasions, ice cream or sherbet. Sunday night there was to be ice cream in honor of the new lodger. "'Good things to eat,' said Ma Smith, as she industriously beat eggs, sugar, and butter together in a large yellow bowl. "'Good things to eat make a man respect himself and look up in the world. You can't feel that you are nobody all the time, if once in a while you eat the same quality of food that a millionaire does.' Dora lighted the lamps all over the house on Sunday night as soon as it fell dark. In the parlor there was a handsome piano lamp, which was used only on special occasions. It was lighted, and threw a soft, warm glow over the neat woolen carpet, the modest furniture, and few ornaments. In a corner stood Dora's piano, given her on her sixteenth birthday by her brother. 
Very soon after seven o'clock the guests began to drop in, and as Dora and her mother were busy still over a few last preparations, Will and John volunteered to act as the reception committee. The first comers were the two occupants of the basement rooms, those which would have answered for the dining-room and kitchen of a moderately well-to-do family living in this class of house. Mrs. Ophelia Davis and Mrs. Sarah Ann White were friends of long standing. They were both born in far-away Louisiana, had been raised on neighboring plantations, and together had sought the blessings of liberty in the North at the close of the war. Mrs. Davis had always been a first-class cook, while Mrs. White tempted fortune as a second girl. As their ideas of life and living enlarged, and they saw the possibilities of enjoying some comfort in a home, they began to think of establishing themselves where they could realize this blessing, and finally hit upon the idea of going into partnership in a laundry. After looking about them for a suitable situation for such a project, their choice finally fell upon Mrs. Smith's house, because of her known respectability, and because they could there come in contact with brighter intellects than their own. For, strange to say, it is a very hopeless case when a colored man or woman does not respect intelligence and good position. "'Yes, Mrs. Smith,' said Mrs. Ophelia Davis, on the day she and Sarah Ann White went to engage the rooms, "'Yes, am I'm tired o' livin' in white folks's kitchens. Yes, am there's lots o' talk about servin' gals not bein' as good as anybody else, especially cooks. Yes, am I can get my five dollars a week with any one. But if you puts on a decent dress to go to church with a Sunday afternoon, the mistress is a-wonderin' how you can afford such style, and you nothin' but a cook in her kitchen. Yes, am I've got a silk dress, two of em, and a lace shawl and a gold watch and chain. People wants to know how'd I get em. I come by em on us, I did. Yes, am when my old mistress left her great house and all that good stuff, silver and things, a layin' that for any one to pick up that had sense enough to know a good thing and get it ahead of anybody else, I just said to myself, Felia, child, now's your time. Yes, am I feathered my nest, I just did. Sarah Ann, you remember that time, honey, and how skeered we was for fear some of them Union soldiers would catch us? You stuffed yourself with greenbacks, but, honey, I took clothes, too. "'Bless God, Sister Ophelia,' replied her friend, with a chuckle and a great shaking of her fat sides. "'Bless God! I disremember how much I did took in that our pile. But, Lord love you, honey, I has got some of that money yet.' The two women engaged the rooms and prospered in their enterprise. The clothes under their deft fingers seemed to gain an added prettiness. They became the style, and no young bride on the back bay felt that she was complete unless the first-class New Orleans laundry placed the finishing polish on the dainty lingerie of her wedding finery. Tonight Mrs. Davis wore the famous black silk dress and gold watch and chain of antebellum days, and Mrs. White was gay in a bright blue silk shirt and rose-colored silk shirt-waist. She said that she did not believe in any of your gloomy colors— for her part, she'd be dead soon enough and have a long time to stay moldering into clay without bearing herself before it was time. The next arrival was the young student preacher from the first square back. He was due at a prayer meeting, but when the time came for him to go there, he peeped over the banister and caught sight of Dora flitting back and forth in the entries, and then a whiff of Ma Smith's famous white cake was borne temptingly to his nostrils and banished the last scruple. He satisfied his conscience by hugging to his breast the idea that his presence was necessary to give the festivities the religious air which was needed for Sunday evening. In his Prince Albert coat and high white stock and tie he entered the parlor early, so that proper decorum might be maintained. Two dressmakers from the second front and back now appeared and were made very welcome by the family, and then Sappho entered. Her dress was plain black, with white chiffon at the neck and wrists, and on her breast a large bunch of jack roses was fastened. With modest self-possession, she moved to Mrs. Smith's side, and soon found herself being presented to the occupants of the parlor. For a moment or two there was an unbroken hush in the room. Tall and fair, with a hair of golden cast, 
aquiline nose, rosebud mouth, soft brown eyes veiled by long dark lashes which swept her cheek, just now covered with a delicate rose flush, she burst upon them, a combination of queen rose and lily in one. "'Lord,' said Ophelia Davis to her friend Sarah Ann, "'I haven't seen anything look like that child since I left home.' "'That's the truth, Philia,' replied Sarah Ann. "'That's something God made, honey. "'There ain't nothing like that growed outside Louisiana. "'Miss Clark,' said Mrs. Davis, during a lull in the conversation, "'I presume you're from Louisiana?' "'My mother was born in New Orleans,' replied the girl. "'I knowed it,' cried Mrs. White, as she triumphantly glanced around the room. "'Old New Orleans blood will tell on itself anywhere. "'These cold-blooded Yankees can't raise nothing that looks like that child. "'No, indeed.' Two or three of the young friends of the family who lived in the neighborhood had now arrived, and the conversation became very animated. Then it was announced that a literary and musical program had been provided. Dora played an opening piece, which was a medley of moody and sankey hymns. Will sang Palm Branches in a musical baritone voice. John contributed a poem, and two young friends gave the duet from Il Trovatore. After a little persuasion, Sappho rendered the chariot race from Ben-Hur in true dramatic style, and breathing so much of the stage that the Reverend Tommy James, the young theologian, felt that possibly he might have made a mistake in going to such hilarious company on the Sabbath. Now, said Mrs. Ophelia Davis, I'm going to sing Suwanee River. None of your highfalutin' things can tetch that song. Dora accompanied her, and soon the air was filled with Mrs. Davis' ambitious attempts to imitate an operatic artist singing that good old-time song. With much wheezing and puffing, for the singer was neither slender nor young, and many would-be fascinating jumps and groans, presumed to be trills and runs, she finished to the relief of the company. Her friend, Mrs. White, looked at her with great approval, and immediately informed them that Philia made a great impression the Sunday before at Tremont Temple. "'The whole congregation was to sing Where's My Wandering Boy. Philia had no paper to see the words, not as that made any matter, cause Philia can't read no how, and the gentleman next us on the other side, he gave Philia a paper that he had. The man wanted to be polite.' Well, Philia was that flattered that she just let herself go, and that man never sung another note he was so surprised. After the second verse, Philia saw the distraction she was making, and she says to me, says she, How's that, Sarah Ann? And I says to her, That's out of sight, Philia. You just ought to seen them white folks look. They was paralyzed. Why, you could hear Philia clean above the organ. Meantime, the young people in the room had gathered in a little knot, and were discussing many questions of the day and their effect upon the colored people. During a pause in the music, the last remark made by John Langley was distinctly heard. Yes, I must admit that our people are improving in their dress, in their looks, and in their manners. "'What's that, John Langley?' asked Mrs. Davis, as she leaned forward to catch the words of the speaker. "'Colored people improving in their manners? "'I should think they was. "'Don't you fool yourself about that now, will you? "'The other night Sarah Ann and me was going down to Beacon Street to deliver some goods, "'and the car was crowded with people, "'and there was a pile of young colored folks on it from the West End. "'Some of them was a-standin' up in that car, "'and every once in a while I noticed that a passenger'd squirm as if Southern had hit him.' Finally, I got so mad I just couldn't see along with such antics from them critters a disgracing theirselves in the whole of the rest of the colored population, and I just elbowed myself into that crowd of young jades. What's that? As Will murmured something under his breath. Was they gals? Yes, they was. Young jades, every one of them. Now, what do yer think they was a doin'? She asked as she swept her gaze over the company. "'Not being a mind-reader, I wouldn't dare to say,' replied John Langley, with a grin of delight. "'They was a-trampin' on to the feet of every white man and woman in that car to show the white folks how free they was. I just took my umbrella and knocked it into two or three of them that I knowed, and told them I'd tell their mothers. 
"'Improving in their manners. "'I should think they was.' At this moment refreshments were served, and the attention of the company was turned to the wants of the inner man. Dora had placed a pretty little tea-table at one side of the room, and Sappho had promised to pour the tea and chocolate. At a sign from Mrs. Smith she took her place, and soon the steaming beverage was cheering the hearts of the guests. The young men vied with each other in serving her. The tea-table became the centre of attraction, in fact, for the whole room. Even the divinity student was drawn into the magic circle, and divided his attention between Sappho and Mrs. Ophelia Davis, for whom he seemed to have a very tender regard. The girl was naturally buoyant and bright, and the influence of the pleasant company in which she found herself seemed to inspire her, and yet no man would have overstepped the bounds of propriety with her in his manner. The pleasant word and jest were free from all coquetry. John was dumb before so much beauty and wit. Will was so blinded by her charms that he was scarcely conscious of what he was doing, but not a word or movement of hers was lost to him. Dora watched the tea-table smilingly. She loved to see her friends enjoy themselves. It never occurred to her to be jealous of the attention given Sappho by her brother and John Langley. Presently there were many pleasant compliments passed on the enjoyable evening which had so quickly flown, and each gentleman proposed a toast which was drunk in a cup of hot chocolate, and as the clock struck ten they all joined hands and united in singing Auld Lang Syne, and praise God from whom all blessings flow. The evening was over, the lights were out, but up in John's attic chamber the two young men smoked a social cigar before separating for the night. They were silent for some time, and then Will said, "'Miss Clark is a very beautiful woman. Don't you think so, John?' "'Well,' replied John, "'beauty is not the word to describe her. She's a stunner, and no mistake.' John went to bed, but Will sat by the fire a longer time than usual, thinking thoughts which had never before troubled his young manhood, and unconsciously one face, the face of Sappho Clark, formed the background of his thoughts. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Contending Forces by Pauline E. Hopkins This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 7 Friendship What is so great as friendship? The only reward of virtue is virtue. The only way to have a friend is to be one. Emerson. After that evening the two girls were much together. Sappho's beauty appealed strongly to Dora's artistic nature, but, hidden beneath the classic outlines of the face, the graceful symmetry of the form, and the dainty coloring of the skin, Dora's shrewd common sense and womanly intuition discovered a character of sterling worth, bold, strong, and ennobling, while into Sappho's lonely self-suppressed life the energetic little Yankee girl swept like a healthful, strengthening breeze. Care was forgotten. There was new joy in living. It was the southern girl's first experience of northern life. True, the seductive skies of her nativity had a potent hold upon her affections, but truth demanded her to recognize the superiority of the vigorous activity in the life all about her. The negro, while held in contempt by many, yet reflected the spirit of his surroundings in his upright carriage, his fearlessness in advancing his opinions, his self-reliance, his anxiety to obtain pain employment that would give to his family some few of the advantages enjoyed by the more favored classes of citizens, his love of liberty, which in its intensity recalled the memory of New England men who had counted all worldly gain as nothing if demanding the sacrifice of even one of the great principles of freedom. It was a new view of the possibilities and probabilities which the future might open to her people. Long she struggled with thoughts which represented to her but vaguely a life beyond anything of which she had ever dreamed. Sappho generally carried her work home in the morning, but ten o'clock would find her seated at her desk and ready to begin her task anew. Some days she was unoccupied, but this did not happen very frequently. 
These free days were the gala days of her existence, when, under Dora's guidance, she explored various points of interest, and learned from observation the great plan of life as practiced in an intelligent, liberty-loving community. Here, in the free air of New England's freest city, Sappho drank great draughts of freedom's subtle elixir. Dora was interested and amused in watching the changes on the mirror-like face of her friend whenever her attention was arrested by a new phenomenon. It was strange to see this girl, resembling nothing so much as a lily in its beautiful purity, shrink from entering a place of public resort for fear of insult. It was difficult to convince her that she might enter a restaurant frequented by educated whites and meet with nothing but the greatest courtesy, that she might take part in the glorious service at fashionable Trinity and be received with punctilious politeness. To this woman, denied association with the vast sources of information which are heirlooms to the lowliest inhabitant of Boston, the noble piles which represented the halls of learning and the massive grandeur of the library free to all seemed to invite her to a full participation in their intellectual joys. She had seen nothing like them. Statuary, paintings, sculptures, all appealed to her beauty-loving nature. The hidden springs of spirituality were satisfied and at rest, claiming kinship with the great minds of the past, whose never-dying works breathed perennial life in the atmosphere of the quiet halls. Now was the beginning of the storm season in New England, and on stormy days the two girls would sit before the fire in Sappho's room and talk of the many things dear to women, while they embroidered or stitched. They sat one cold, snowy day. The storm had started the afternoon before and had raged with unceasing fury all night, snow and rain which the increasing cold quickly turned into cutting sleet. Morning had brought relief from the high winds, and the temperature had moderated somewhat, but the snow still fell steadily, drifting into huge piles, which made the streets impassable. It was the first great storm Sappho had seen. It was impossible for her to leave home, so she begged Dora to pass the day with her and play company, like the children. Dora was nothing loath, and as soon as her morning duties were finished, she told her mother that she was going visiting, and would not be at home until tea-time. By eleven o'clock they had locked the door of Sappho's room to keep out all intruders, had mended the fire until the little stove gave out a delicious warmth, and had drawn the window-curtains close to keep out stray currents of air. Sappho's couch was drawn close beside the stove while Dora's small person was most cosily bestowed in her favorite rocking-chair. It was a very convenient stove that Sappho had in her room. The ornamental top could be turned back on its movable hinge, and there was a flat stove-cover ready to hold any vessel and heat its contents to just the right temperature. Sappho was prouder of that stove than a daughter of fortune would have been of the most expensive silver chafing-dish. It was very near lunch-time, so the top was turned back, and the little copper tea-kettle was beginning to sing its welcome song. Dora had placed a small round table between the couch and the rocker. A service for two was set out in dainty china dishes, cream and sugar looking doubly tempting as it gleamed and glistened in the delicate ware. One plate was piled with thinly cut slices of bread and butter, another held slices of pink ham. Sappho lay back among her cushions, lazily stretching her little slippered feet toward the warm stove, where the fire burned so cheerily and glowed so invitingly as it shone through the isinglass door. She folded her arms above her head, and turned an admiring gaze on the brown face of her friend, who swayed gently back and forth in her rocking-chair, her feet on a hassock, and a scarlet afghan wrapped about her knees. Dora was telling Sappho all about her engagement to John Langley and their plans for the future. "'I think you will be happy, Dora, if you love him. All things are possible if love is the foundation stone,' said Sappho, after a slight pause, as she nestled among her pillows. Dora was sitting bolt upright with the usual business-like look on her face. 
I like him well enough to marry him, but I don't believe there's enough sentiment in me to make love a great passion, such as we read of in books. Do you believe marriage is the beautiful state it is painted by writers? Why, yes, laughed Sappho. I wouldn't believe anything else for your sake, my little brownie. No joking, Sappho, this is dead earnest. Don't you ever expect to marry, and don't you speculate about the pros and cons, and the maybes and perhapses of the situation? asked Dora, as she filled the cups with steaming cocoa and passed one to her friend. Dora, you little gourmand, what have you got in the refrigerator? A box ingeniously nailed to the window seat outside and filled with shelves, and having a substantial door, was the ice box, or refrigerator, where Sappho kept materials handy for a quick lunch. Dora closed the window and returned quickly to her seat, placing a glass dish on the table as she did so. It's only part of a cream pie that Ma had left last night. I thought it would help out nicely with our lunch. What? Again? said Sappho significantly. That's the fourth time this week, and here it is but Friday. You'll be as fat as a seal, and then John P. won't want you at any price. Take warning, and depart from the error of your ways before it is too late. Dora laughed guiltily and said, as she drew a box from her apron pocket, "'Well, here are John's chocolate bonbons that he brought last night. I suppose you won't want me to touch them for fear of getting fat.' Sappho shook her head in mock despair. "'And your teeth, your beautiful white teeth, where will they be shortly if you persist in eating a pound of bonbons every day? Think of your fate, Dora, and pause in your reckless career.' Forty inches about the waist and only scraggy snags to show me when you grin. Thank heaven I'll never come to that while there's a dentist in the city of Boston. I'll eat all the bonbons I want in spite of you, Sappho, and if you don't hurry I'll eat your slice of cream pie, too. And at this dire threat there ensued a scramble for the pie, mingled with peals of merry laughter, until all rosy and sparkling, Sappho emerged from the fray with a dish containing her share of the dainty held high in the air. Presently lunch was over, and they resumed their old positions, preparing to take comfort. "'You haven't answered my question yet, Sappho.' "'To tell you the truth, I had forgotten your remark, Dora. What was it?' "'I suspect that is a bit of a fib to keep me from teasing you about getting married. What I want to know is, do you ever mean to marry, or are you going to pine in single blessedness on my hands, and be a bachelor maid to the end? Well, replied Sappho, with a comical twist to her face, in the words of Gulliver, I mote, and then again I motent. What troubles me is having a man bothering around. Now I tell John P. that I'm busy, or something like that, and I'm rid of him. But after you marry a man, he's on your hands for good and all. I'm wondering if my love could stand the test. That's queer talk for an engaged girl with a fine, handsome fellow to quarter. Why, Dora, I'm surprised at you, laughed Sappho gaily. I'm not ashamed of John P.'s appearance in company. He looks all right. But when one is terribly in love, one is supposed to want the dear object always near. But matches, love matches, my child, turn out so badly that a girl hesitates to get jined any man for betterer or worserer, as Dr. Peters says. Then I get tired of a man so soon, this with a doleful sigh. I dread to think of being tied to John for good and all. I know I'll be sick of him inside of a week. I do despair of ever being like other girls. Sappho laughed outright at the woebegone countenance before her. "'It's generally the other way. The men get tired of us first. A woman loves one man, and is true to him through all eternity.' "'That's just what makes me feel so unsexed, so to speak. I like John's looks. He's the style among all the girls in our set. I like to know that I can claim him before them all. It's fun to see him fluttering around him kindly trying to put my nose out of joint. I must say that I feel real comfortable to spoil sport by walking off with him just when they think they've got things running as they wish. Yes, it's real comfortable to know that they're all jealous as can be. 
but for all that I know I'll get tired of him. Let us hope not, if you have really made up your mind to marry him. Dora, sometimes I am afraid that you mean what you say. I notice that you call him John P. What's the P for? Pollock. John Pollock Langley. His grandfather was his father's master, and Pollock was his name, sang Dora, as she rocked gently to and fro. Now there's Arthur Lewis, she continued. He's jolly fun. He isn't a fascinator or anything of that sort. He's just good. Who is he? asked Sappho, with languid interest. Properly speaking, he's Dr. Arthur Lewis. We were children together, although he is five years older than I. He's a fine scholar and a great business man. He has a large industrial school in Louisiana. He's gone up in the world, I tell you, since we made mud pies on the back doorsteps. But I never think of him except as old Arthur, who used to drag me to school on his sled. There was a gleam of fun in Sappho's eyes, as she said demurely, "'You seem to know all about him. Was he ever a lover of yours?' "'Lover? No, indeed,' Dora flushed vividly under her brown skin. "'The idea of Arthur as my lover is too absurd.' "'Excuse me, dear, for my mistake,' said Sappho mischievously. "'I didn't know but that he might be the mysterious link which would join love, marriage, and the necessary man in a harmonious whole.' "'Well,' said Dora, after a slight pause, blushing furiously, "'I don't say he wouldn't like the role.' You'll see him soon. He's coming to Boston on business in a few weeks. Oh, we've had rare times together. She sighed and smiled, lost for the moment in pleasant memories. Sappho smiled, too, in sympathy with her mood. Ah, yes, I think I understand. Poor John. John's all right. Don't shed any tears over him, said Dora testily. They sat a while in silence listening to the sound of the whirling frozen flakes wind-driven against the window-panes. It was scarce three o'clock, but darkness was beginning to envelop the city, and it was already a pleasant twilight in the room. "'Tell me about Dr. Lewis and his work, Dora,' said Sappho presently. "'Do you know he interests me exceedingly?' "'I don't really understand Arthur's hobbies, but I believe that he is supposed to be doing a great work in the Black Belt.' His argument is, as I understand it, that industrial education and the exclusion of politics will cure all our race troubles. I doubt it, returned Sappho quickly, with an impatient toss of the head. That reasoning might be practically illustrated with benefit to us for a few years in the South, but to my mind would not affect a permanent cure for race troubles if we are willing to admit that human nature is the same in us as in others. The time will come when our men will grow away from the trammels of narrow prejudice, and desire the same treatment that is accorded to other men. Why, one can but see that any degree of education and development will not fail of such a result. I am willing to confess that the subject is a little deep for me, replied Dora. I am not the least bit of a politician, and I generally accept whatever the men tell me is right. But I know that there is something very wrong in our lives, and nothing seems to remedy the evils under which the colored man labors. But you can see, can't you, that if our men are deprived of the franchise, we become aliens in the very land of our birth? Arthur says that would be better for us. The great loss of life would cease, and we should be at peace with the whites. Oh, how can he argue so falsely? I have lived beneath the system of oppression in the South. If we lose the franchise, at the same time we shall lose the respect of all other citizens. Temporizing will not benefit us. Rather, it will leave us branded as cowards, not worthy of a freeman's respect, an alien people without a country and without a home. Dora gazed at her friend with admiration, and wished that she had a Kodak, so that she might catch just the expression that lighted her eyes and glowed in a bright color upon her cheeks. I predict some fun when you and Arthur meet. I'll just start you both out some night, and you'll be spitting at each other like two cats inside of five minutes. Arthur thinks that women should be seen and not heard where politics is under discussion. Insufferable prig! exclaimed Sappho with snapping eyes. Oh, no, he isn't. Arthur's all right. But, you see, he is living in the South. His work is there, 
and he must keep in with the whites of the section where his work lies, or all he has accomplished will go for naught, and perhaps his life might be forfeited too. I see the mess of pottage in the birthright. Bless you, not so bad as that. But money makes the mare go, returned Dora, with a wink at her friend, and a shrewd business look on her bright little Yankee face. I say to you, as Arthur says to me when I tell him what I think of his system, If you want honey, you must have money. I don't know anything about politics, as I said before, but my opinion won't cost you anything. When we can say that lots of our men are as rich as Jews, there'll be no question about the franchise, and my idea is that Arthur will be one of the Jews. Oh! exclaimed Sappho disgustedly as she resumed her lounging position. Sappho, how did you come to take up stenography? I should have thought you would have preferred teaching. I had to live, my dear. I could not teach school because my education does not include a college course. I could not do housework because my constitution is naturally weak. It was noticeable in these confidential chats that Sappho never spoke of her early life. Dora had confided to her friend every event of importance that had occurred in her young life, and, in harmless gossip, had related the history of all the friends who visited the house intimately. But all this had begot no like unburdening to eager ears of the early history of her friend. Wonderful to relate, however, Dora did not resent this reserve, which she could see was studied. It spoke well for the sincerity of the love that had taken root in her heart for Sappho, that it subdued her inquisitiveness, and she gladly accepted her friendship without asking troublesome questions. How did you finally succeed in getting work? I've always heard that it was very difficult for colored girls to find employment in offices where your class of work is required. And so it is, my dear. I sometimes think that if I lose the work I am on, I shall not try for another position. I shall never forget the day I started out to find work. The first place that I visited was all right, until the man found I was colored. Then he said that his wife wanted a nurse girl, and he had no doubt that she would be glad to hire me, for I looked good-tempered. At the second place where I ventured to intrude, the proprietor said, "'Yes, we want a stenographer, but we've no work for your kind.' However, that was preferable to the insulting familiarity which some men assumed. It was dreadful. I don't like to think about it. Father Andrew induced the man for whom I am working to employ me. I do not interfere with the other help, because I take my work home. Many of the other clerks have never seen me, and so the proprietor runs no risk of being bothered with complaints from them. He treats me very well, too. I have heard many girls tell much the same tale about other lines of business, said Dora. It makes me content to do the work of this house and not complain. You ought to thank God every day for such a refuge as you have in your home. I cannot understand people. Here in the North we are allowed every privilege. There seems to be no prejudice until we seek employment. Then every door is closed against us. Can you explain this? No, I cannot. To my way of thinking, the whole thing is a Chinese puzzle. "'Bless my soul! Just look at that clock!' exclaimed Dora, as she scrambled to her feet and began gathering up her scattered property. Five o'clock and tea to get. Sappho, you've been lazy enough for one day. Come downstairs and help me get tea. The boys will be here in no time, as hungry as bears.' Piloted by Dora, Sappho became well acquainted with ancient landmarks of peculiar interest to the colored people. They visited the home for the aged women on M Street, and read and sang to the occupants. They visited St. Monica's Hospital, and carried clothes, flowers, and a little money saved from the cost of contemplated Easter finery. They scattered brightness along with charitable acts wherever a case of want was brought to their attention. Dora had accepted the position of organist for a prominent colored church in the city. There was a small salary attached to the place, which she was glad to receive. Sappho usually went with her to choir rehearsals, and, sitting in the shadows, well hidden from view, would think over the romantic history of the fine old edifice. 
the building, so the story ran, was the place of worship of a rich white Baptist congregation in the years preceding the emancipation. Negroes were allowed in the galleries only. Believing this color bar to be a stigma on the house of God, a few of the members protested, but, finding their warnings unheeded, withdrew from the church, and finally found a Sabbath home in an old building long used as a theater. These people prospered and grew rich and powerful. Colored people were always welcome in the congregation. The society in the old church, left to itself, had at last been glad to sell the building to its present occupants. Thus the despised people, who were not allowed a seat outside of the galleries, now owned and occupied the scene of their former humiliation. It was a solemn and wonderful dispensation of providence, and filled the girl's heart with strong emotion. During these evenings, when she waited for the close of the rehearsals, she became acquainted with many odd specimens of the race, men of brain and thought, but of unique expression, and filled with quaint humor. One of these characters was known as Dr. Abraham Peters. Dr. Peters was a well-read man, greatly interested in scientific research, but who had lacked the opportunity to obtain information in his youth. He had been a slave when a boy, a few years before the Civil War. Now he was the church janitor, and to eke out his scanty income kept a little boot-black stand just around the corner from the church, and, knowing something of medicine and nursing the sick, had advertised himself as a magnetic physician. He displayed much skill and practice, and had acquired something of a local reputation. Dr. Peters and Sappho were good friends, and he brought out all his store of knowledge, proudly displaying it for her approval. "'You see, Miss Sappho, I knocked about the world some considerable,' he said one night, in his soft southern tones and quaint northernized dialect, as they sat in the cosy vestry waiting for the close of the rehearsal. "'Been poorer than any church mouse. But I've saved something, and I know the world. Perhaps you's interested enough in an old man to hear how I come to vertise myself as a magnifying doctor, and where I picked it up, eh?' "'Yes,' replied Sappho. I certainly am interested in your story. Well, while they're caterwauling on that Easter anthem in ten flats, I reckon I'll have time to tell you all about it. First I knowed about magnetics was brought to my attention down home. Some people said I had the evil eye, and some said it was only a strong eye. But be that homesome ever, it was a bad eye, and a terror to watermelon thieves when it was my watch on the chicken houses. Magnifying and hoodooing is about the same thing down there, though since the surrender most all old-time doings is done way. About the time I realized that I had this power, I had experienced religion, and I had been justified and concentrated, so that I got the blessing. Them days, too, I was a-sartin' out to court my Susie, that's my wife, and all the young fellows round the county was a-sprucin' up to her just like crows round Karen. Sunday was the day I had most on my mind, cause they'd ride up and hitch our mules in a line all along the old man's fence. You see, he had right smart property, and I spec that had a mighty drawn influence on some of them shiftless fellows who had enough sconch to start their own mule team up a hill. And thou they'd sot like so many buzzards waiting for a chance to slice Susie off to church under my nose. I had to work lively, I tell you. Susie was kind of skittish and restless, and it was first come first served with her, being she had her choice. Well, just at the time I got the blessing, I got the insurance that Susie was gwine to have me. All the fellers was satisfied but Possum to it. Possum and me was boys together, and we'd both run each other pretty hard, striving to come through first at the mourner's bench as well as to get the gal. Possum was beat when he found I had a full hand and had swept the pot. Oom um, hoo laughed Brother Jones, who was an interested listener to Dr. Peter's story. Oom um, hoo Brother Peters, done guy yourself way. What you know about full hands and pots? Who give himself way, Brother Jones? Ever hear me say I's better than any one else in this church? I'm a man, si, I'm a man. I's done trespassed on the flesh pots of Egypt as much as any other man. Don't you oom um, who me, brothers, no sir. Tetch you saw a place, brother Peters, tetch you saw a place, laughed the brother as he walked away, 
his shoulders shaking like great mounds of jelly. It was some minutes before Dr. Peters could recover his equilibrium and go on with his tale. Possum to it was so mad and disappointed that he finally challenged me to fight a jewel. I wasn't in no state of mind to be killed by any of his hoodoo tricks, possum being an export at putting spells and such, like on anybody for from twenty-five cents up to five dollars. Neither did I want Susie to think I was afraid of possum to it. So there I was tween a hawk and a buzzard. Well, I accepted the challenge, and being the defendant in the matter, of course, I had the choice of weapons, and I choose rifles. We kept mighty secret about the arrangements, and met at moonrise on a field just back of the graveyard. The seconds measured off ten spaces after we'd shooken hands, and we each stepped to our places. Though it was a solemn occasion, I wasn't scared, but Possum was a-rollin' up the whites of his eyes, and you could hear his teeth chatter worse than dried corn shucks. Ike Watkins was head second, and he stood tween us, holdin' his red bandana in his hand, waitin' to say the word. "'Gentlemen, is you ready?' he says. "'Let her go, Ike,' says I. "'Take aim,' says he, and I pinted the rifle at Possum, and callin' up all the power in me, I threw it along the body of the gun, plumb tween Possum's eyes, just above the bridge of his nose. And that was a fair target, because the bridge of Possum's nose was a miracle for size. Possum gave a yell when he felt the strength of that eye, that would have spluch a year pan in two and in two seconds he was in the worst alpaca fit you ever seen. The seconds acknowledged me the victor by a reckless invention of providence, they being aware that the adversary wasn't hit by a narrow bullet, the rifles being loaded with salt for fear of mischief. Possum owned up like a man that I was more powerful than him because of the supernatural strength in my bad eye. Well, I kept on praying for more faith until I got the power in my hands, and by laying em on a sick person I could electrocute em instantly, and their bad feelings would disappear. People got the notion I could pray a person right out of the grave, and my fame spread abroad until I began charging for my services, explaining to my patients that the dead might be raised, but not for nothing, after which I see to fallen off in my popularity. Business being purty brief just then, I took Susie and moved up north and went to cookin' on a steamboat. I've done most everything in this world, honey, as I told you, to get an honest livin' without stealin' it. And I don't know, added the old man reflectively, as he stroked the gray stubby fringe on his chin. I don't know as I'm any too good if I got pushed real hard to help myself out. Humans is humans, and I've seen many a well-intentioned fellow settin' in the caboose when times was hard and the mule mortgaged for a full value to three men at once to buy a meal and bread and hog and hominy and tobacco. But most and generally, I've got along without silin' my hands with other people's property. Well, honey, they paid me fifteen dollars a month and found for being head cook, and I paid ten dollars a month house rent out of that. Things was purty brief, purty brief. Times was more and more spurious, and it was work your wits, Abraham Peters, to get a livin'. I just didn't know which way to turn. One day I got a telegraph at the other end of the route that the baby was dead and no money to pay the undertaker, and the old woman sick in the bed from worryin'. The Lord just seemed to pour his blessin' down on us in a house full of chillin. After Susie had twenty, I used to pray the Lord to stop blessin' us that way, "'cause he could see for himself that too many blessings was a gettin' to be a nuisance. "'I cooked the dinner myself that day, being the other cook was ashore, "'and you believe me, I sung and I prayed and I wrestled for help "'in that old steamboat kitchen down behind my biggest brass biler "'where I was covered from prying eyes. "'All of a sudden I felt the power, and the Lord spoke to me and he said, "'Get up, Abraham Peters.' and go out and hoodoo the first man you meet. Bless your child, I rise up in a hurry and I started out, not knowing no more than nothing what was meant by that. First man I saw when I got on deck was the captain. I went up to him and I smiled. I must have had a purty picture with my face all grease and tears. I says, not thinking what words I was going to utter. Morning, captain. 
How's your corporosity seem to sagatiate? Cap'n, he roared. You could have heard him holler up to Boston. He slapped me on the back, and he says, Hey, Peters, that's the gall darndest thing I ever heard. With that, he hauled out a five-dollar bill and gave me, and walked off a-laughing fit to kill hisself. By night I had twenty dollars in my pocket, and everybody on the boat was calling me corporosity sagatiate. I've used that hoodoo ever since, and I ain't found nary white gentleman can't seem to get away from it without showing the color of his money. One of the owners of the boat took a great liking to me, and he says to me one day, says he, Abe, how'd you like to work ashore so you could be nearer your family and get better pay? Like it, says I. If you don't want to pulverize me, don't make me no such an offer. He laughed a bit, and then he says, I've got a big building up Washington Street, and I want a trusty man to keep it clean and look after the tenants. I'll give you ten dollars a week. I took off my cap, and I truly bowed down to that man, and I says, The Lord's been a-working on your heart, Mr. Pearson. Maybe he has, says he. Anyhow, you can pack up and go ashore next trip. Your place will be waiting for you. First thing I knowed, I was bossing a big job of janitoring. Most of the people in the building was Christian science. After they'd got a little bit acquainted with me, they found out the power I had in my hands for laying on. "'Twa'n't long before I was picking up bright smart nursing nights. "'Don't suppose you know much about this science business, do you?' "'Sappho confessed her ignorance. "'Christian science is a faith cure. "'That is, it's using your brains and training them to know "'that there's nothing tall the matter with you if you only think there ain't. "'They argify that all sickness is a mistake cause it's imaginary. "'I don't believe that, though, cause I had the rheumatism while I was there.' and the doctors started in to cure me by praying and working on my body through my spirit, and it warn't no more good than nothing tall. I've got as much faith as any living man, but rheumatism is one of them things that convince you again your will. It will draw speech out of a deaf mute and make a blind man see, when them pains is a-grinding into your bones and giants worse than a saw cutting through knots in a cord wood stick. I'm free to say that curing my mind didn't have no effect on my pain, and I just kept on seeing blue blazes and swearing like mad. I allow that faith can move mountains, faith as little as a mustard seed, and that's mighty small. If you believe you'll get what she wants and asks for, that's faith. That's good, that's all right. Trouble is we don't believe it according to Scripture. We get mad when our prayers ain't answered not thinkin' it's cause we ain't got horse sense enough to use discretion and puttin' our faith in subjects that is approvin' to the Lord, and will fit in with his own ideas about runnin' the business of the universe. And that's where faith cure is weak, cause it's come in injunction with God. Faith cure won't operate on any man, where it was preordinated that a particular man was to die with a particular complaint. No, we ain't up to come in injunction with the Lord's business." There's a number of grand diversions to Christian science. There's hypnism and pessimism and another of other isms, but they all bear the same way, a sort of a plastic healing of sickness. The doctors kept after me about my gifts of healing and very kindly showed me wherein I could make an honest dollar, and business being business, I finally determined to adopt magnifying as a profession. I've been in the business nigh upon ten years now, and I've picked up as good a living as any colored gentleman who has worked a sight harder and had to take piles of unregenerate sass from his boss. That night they walked home together after the rehearsal, the four young people, Dora and John, Sappho and Will. Some one of the choir boys walking ahead of them was singing in a sweet, high tenor voice the refrain of an old love song, Couldst thou but know how much I love thee? It suited Will's mood and voiced his dream exquisitely. Along the heavens the northern lights streamed in radiance. Meteors bright and shooting stars added to the beauty of the night. The moon at its full shed the light of day about them. The wind whispered amidst the leafless branches of the huge old trees on the common and public garden as they passed them on their homeward way. Once Will took her hand in his— 
She let it stay a moment while she made an incoherent little speech about clouds and trees. Will said nothing. It was not time yet, he told himself. He would wait a little longer. End of chapter 7《Chapter Eight of Contending Forces by Pauline E. Hopkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight: The Sewing Circle. Where village statesmen talked with looks profound, imagination fondly stoops to trace the parlor splendors of that festive place. Yes, let the rich deride, the proud disdain these simple blessings of the lowly train. To me, more dear. One native charm than all the gloss of art. Goldsmith. Ma Smith was a member of the church referred to in the last chapter, the most prominent one of color in New England. It was situated in the heart of the West End, and was a very valuable piece of property. Every winter this church gave many entertainments to aid in paying off the mortgage, which at this time amounted to about eight thousand dollars. Mrs. Smith, as the chairman of the board of stewardesses, was inaugurating a fair, one that should eclipse anything of similar nature ever attempted by the colored people, and numerous sewing circles were being held among the members all over the city. Parlor entertainments, where an admission fee of ten cents was collected from every patron, were also greatly in vogue, and the money thus obtained was put into a fund to defray the expense of purchasing eatables and decorations, and paying for the printing of tickets, circulars, etc., for the fair. The strongest forces of the colored people in the vicinity were to combine and lend their aid in making a supreme effort to clear this magnificent property. Boston contains a number of well-to-do families of color, whose tax bills show a most comfortable return each year to the city treasury. Strange as it may seem, these well-to-do people, in goodly numbers, distribute themselves and their children among the various Episcopal churches with which the city abounds, the government of which holds out the welcome hand to the brother in black, who is drawn to unite his fortunes with the members of this particular denomination. It may be true that the beautiful ritual of the church is responsible in some measure for this. Colored people are nothing if not beauty lovers and for such a people the grandeur of the service has great attractions. But in justice to this church, one must acknowledge that it has been instrumental in doing much toward helping this race to help itself, along the lines of brotherly interest. These people were well represented within the precincts of Mrs. Smith's pretty parlor one afternoon, all desirous of lending their aid to help along the great project. As we have said, Mrs. Smith occupied the back parlor of the house as her chamber, and within this room the matrons had assembled to take charge of the cutting out of different garments, and here, too, the sewing machine was placed ready for use. In the parlor proper all the young ladies were seated, ready to perform any service which might be required of them in the way of putting garments together. By two o'clock all the members of the sewing circle were in their places. The parlor was crowded. Mrs. Willis, the brilliant widow of a bright negro politician, had charge of the girls, and after the sewing had been given out, the first business of the meeting was to go over events of interest to the negro race which had transpired during the week throughout the country. These facts had been previously tabulated upon a blackboard which was placed upon an easel, and occupied a conspicuous position in the room. Each one was supposed to contribute anything of interest that she had read or heard in that time for the benefit of all. After these points had been gone over, Mrs. Willis gave a talk upon some topic of interest. At six o'clock tea was to be served in the kitchen, the company taking refreshment in squads of five. At eight o'clock all unfinished work would be folded and packed away in the convenient little Boston bag to be finished at home and the male friends of the various ladies were expected to put in an appearance. Music and recitations were to be enjoyed for two hours, ice cream and cake being sold for the benefit of the cause. Mrs. Willis was a good example of a class of women of color that came into existence at the close of the Civil War. She was not a rara avis, 
but one of many possibilities which the future will develop from among the colored women of New England. Every city or town from Maine to New York has its Mrs. Willis. Keen in her analysis of human nature, most people realized, after a short acquaintance, in which they ran the gamut of emotions from strong attraction to repulsion, that she had sifted them thoroughly, while they had gained nothing in return. Shrewd in business matters, many a subtle businessman had been worsted by her apparent womanly weakness and charming simplicity. With little money, she yet contrived to live in quiet elegance, even including the little journeys from place to place, so adroitly managed as to increase her influence at home and her fame abroad. Well-read and thoroughly conversant with all current topics, she impressed one as having been liberally educated and polished by travel, whereas a high school course more than covered all her opportunities. Even today it is erroneously believed that all racial development among colored people has taken place since emancipation. It is impossible of belief for some that little circles of educated men and women of color have existed since the Revolutionary War. Some of these people were born free, some have lost the memory of servitude in the dim past, a greater number by far were recruited from the energetic slaves of the South who toiled when they should have slept for the money that purchased their freedom, or else they boldly took the rights which man denied. Mrs. Willis was one from among these classes. The history of her descent could not be traced, but somewhere, somehow, a strain of white blood had filtered through the African stream. At sixty-odd she was vigorous, well-preserved, broad and comfortable in appearance, with an aureole of white hair crowning a pleasant face. She had loved her husband with a love ambitious for his advancement, his foot on the stairs mounting to the two-room tenement which constituted their home in the early years of married life, had sent a thrill to her very heart as she sat sewing baby clothes for the always expected addition to the family. But twenty years make a difference in all our lives. It brought many changes to the colored people of New England, social and business changes. Politics had become the open sesame for the ambitious Negro. A seat in the legislature, then, was not a dream to this man, urged by the loving woman behind him. Other offices of trust were quickly offered him when his worth became known. He grasped his opportunity, grew richer, more polished, less social, and the family broadened out and overflowed from old familiar West End environments across the River Charles into the aristocratic suburbs of Cambridge. Death comes to us all. Money, the sinews of living and social standing, she did not possess upon her husband's death. Therefore she was forced to begin a weary pilgrimage, a hunt for the means to help her breast the social tide. The best opening, she decided after looking carefully about her, was in the great cause of the evolution of true womanhood in the work of the woman question as embodied in marriage and suffrage. She could talk dashingly on many themes for which she had received much applause in bygone days, when in private life she had held forth in the drawing-room of some back-bay philanthropist who sought to use her talents as an attraction for a worthy charitable object, the discovery of a rare species of versatility in the negro character being a sure drawing-card. It was her boast that she had made the fortunes of her family and settled her children well in life. The advancement of the colored woman should be the new problem in the woman question that should float her upon its tide into the prosperity she desired. And she succeeded well in her plans. Conceived in selfishness, they yet bore glorious fruit in the formation of clubs of colored women banded together for charity, for study, for every reason under God's glorious heavens that can better the condition of mankind. Trivialities are not to be despised. Inborn love implanted in a woman's heart for a luxurious, aesthetic home life, running on well-oiled wheels amid flowers, sunshine, books and priceless pamphlets, easy chairs and French gowns, may be the means of developing a Paderewski or freeing a race from servitude. 
It was amusing to watch the way in which she governed societies and held her position. In her hands committees were as wax, and loud murmurings against the tyranny of her rule died down to judicious whispers. If a vote went contrary to her desires, it was in her absence. Thus she became the pivot about which all the social and intellectual life of the colored people of her section revolved. No one had yet been found with the temerity to contest her position, which, like the title of nobility, bade fair to descend to her children. It was thought that she might be eclipsed by the younger and more brilliant women students on the strength of their alma mater, but she still held her own by sheer force of will-power and indomitable pluck. The subject of the talk at this meeting was the place which the virtuous woman occupies in upbuilding a race. After a few explanatory remarks, Mrs. Willis said, I am particularly anxious that you should think upon this matter seriously, because of its intrinsic value to all of us as race women. I am not less anxious because you represent the coming factors of our race. Shortly you must fill the positions now occupied by your mothers, and it will rest with you and your children to refute the charges brought against us as to our moral irresponsibility, and the low moral standard maintained by us in comparison with other races. Did I understand you to say that the negro woman in her native state is truly a virtuous woman? asked Sappho, who had been very silent during the bustle attending the opening of the meeting. Travellers tell us that the native African woman is impregnable in her virtue, replied Mrs. Willis. So we have sacrificed that attribute in order to acquire civilization, chimed in Dora. No, not sacrificed, but pushed one side by the force of circumstances. Let us thank God that it is an essential attribute peculiar to us, a racial characteristic which is slumbering, but not lost, replied Mrs. Willis. But let us not forget the definition of virtue, strength to do the right thing under all temptations. Our ideas of virtue are too narrow. We confine them to that conduct which is ruled by our animal passions alone. It goes deeper than that. General excellence in every duty of life is what we may call virtue. Do you think, then, that negro women will be held responsible for all the lack of virtue that is being laid to their charge to-day? I mean, do you think that God will hold us responsible for the illegitimacy with which our race has been obliged, as it were, to flood the world? asked Sappho. I believe that we shall not be held responsible for wrongs which we have unconsciously committed, or which we have committed under compulsion. We are virtuous or non-virtuous only when we have a choice under temptation. We cannot by any means apply the word to a little child who has never been exposed to temptation, nor to the Supreme Being who cannot be tempted with evil. So with the African brought to these shores against his will, the state of morality which implies will-power on his part does not exist, therefore he is not a responsible being. The sin and its punishment lies with the person consciously false to his knowledge of right. From this we deduce the truism that the civility of no race is perfect whilst another race is degraded. I shall never forget my feelings, chimed in Anna Stevens, a school teacher of a very studious temperament, at certain remarks made by the Reverend John Thomas at one of his noonday lectures in the temple. He was speaking on different races, and had in his vigorous style been sweeping his audience with him at a high elevation of thought which was dazzling to the faculties, and almost impossible to follow in some points. Suddenly he touched upon the negro, and with impressive gesture and lowered voice thanked God that the mulatto race was dying out, because it was a mongrel mixture which combined the worst elements of two races. Lo, the poor mulatto! despised by the blacks of his own race, scorned by the whites. Let him go out and hang himself. In her indignation Anna forgot the scissors, and bit her thread off viciously with her little white teeth. Mrs. Willis smiled as she said calmly, My dear Anna, 
I would not worry about the fate of the mulatto, for the fate of the mulatto will be the fate of the entire race. Did you never think that to-day the black race on this continent has developed into a race of mulattoes? Why, Mrs. Willis came in a chorus of voices. Yes, continued Mrs. Willis, still smiling. It is an incontrovertible truth that there is no such thing as an unmixed black on the American continent. Just bear in mind that we cannot tell by a person's complexion whether he be dark or light in blood, for by the working of the natural laws the white father and black mother produce the mulatto offspring. The black father and the white mother, the mulatto offspring also, while the black father and quadroon mother produce the black child, which to the eye alone is a child of unmixed black blood. I will venture to say that, out of a hundred apparently pure black men, not one will be able to trace an unmixed flow of African blood since landing upon these shores. What an unhappy example of the frailty of all human intellects, when such a man and scholar as Dr. Thomas could so far allow his prejudices to dominate his better judgment as to add one straw to the burden which is popularly supposed to rest upon the unhappy mulattoes of a despised race, finished the lady, with a dangerous flash of her large dark eyes. Mrs. Willis, said Dora, with a scornful little laugh, I am not unhappy, and I am a mulatto. I just enjoy my life, and I don't want to die before my time comes either. There are lots of good things left on earth to be enjoyed even by mulattoes, and I want my share. Yes, my dear, and I hope you may all live and take comfort in the proper joys of your lives. While we are all content to accept life and enjoy it along the lines which God has laid down for us as individuals as well as a race, we shall be happy and get the best out of life. Now, let me close this talk by asking you to remember one maxim written of your race by a good man. Happiness and social position are not to be gained by pushing. Let the world, by its need of us along certain lines, and our intrinsic fitness for these lines, push us into the niche which God has prepared for us. So shall our lives be beautified and our race raised in the civilization of the future, as we grow away from all these prejudices which have been the instruments of our advancement, according to the intention, from an all-seeing omnipotence, from the beginning. Never mind our poverty, ignorance, and the slights and injuries which we bear at the hands of a higher race. With the thought ever before us of what the Master suffered to raise all humanity to its present degree of prosperity and intelligence, let us cultivate, while we go about our daily tasks, no matter how inferior they may seem to us, beauty of the soul and mind, which, being transmitted to our children by the law of heredity, shall improve the race by eliminating immorality from our midst and raising morality and virtue to their true place. Thirty-five years of liberty have made us a new people. The marks of servitude and oppression are dropping slowly from us. Let us hasten the transformation of the body by the nobility of the soul. For of the soul the body form doth take, for soul is form, and doth the body make, quoted Dora. Yes, said Mrs. Willis with a smile. That is the idea exactly, and well expressed. Now I hope that through the coming week you will think of what we have talked about this afternoon, for it is of the very first importance to all people, but particularly to so young folks. Sappho, who had been thoughtfully embroidering pansies on white linen, now leaned back in her chair for a moment and said, Mrs. Willis, there is one thing which puzzles me. How are we to overcome the nature which is given us? I mean, how can we eliminate passion from our lives, and emerge into the purity which marked the life of Christ? So many of us desire purity and think to have found it, but in a moment of passion, or under the pressure of circumstances which we cannot control, we commit some horrid sin, and the taint of it sticks and will not leave us, and we grow to loathe ourselves." Passion, my dear Miss Clark, 
is a state in which the will lies dormant, and all other desires become subservient to one. Enthusiasm for any one object or duty may become a passion. I believe that in some degree passion may be beneficial, but we must guard ourselves against a sinful growth of any appetite. All work, of whatever character, as I look at it, needs a certain amount of absorbing interest to become successful, and it is here that the Christian life gains its greatest glory in teaching us how to keep ourselves from abusing any of our human attributes. We are not held responsible for compulsory sin, only for the sin that is pleasant to our thoughts and palatable to our appetites. All desires and hope with which we are endowed are good in the sight of God, only it is left for us to discover their right uses. Do I cover your ground? Yes and no, replied Sappho, but perhaps at some future time you will be good enough to talk with me personally upon this subject. Dear child, sit here by me. It is a blessing to look at you. Beauty like yours is inspiring. You seem to be troubled. What is it? If I can comfort or strengthen, it is all I ask. She pressed the girl's hand in hers, and drew her into a secluded corner. For a moment the floodgates of suppressed feeling flew open in the girl's heart, and she longed to lean her head on that motherly breast and unburden her sorrows there. "'Mrs. Willis, I am troubled greatly,' she said at length. "'I am so sorry. Tell me, my love, what it is all about.' Just as the barriers of Sappho's reserve seemed about to be swept away, there followed almost instantly a wave of repulsion toward this woman and her effusiveness, so forced and insincere. Sappho was very impressionable, and yielded readily to the influence which fell like a cold shadow between them. She drew back as from an abyss suddenly beheld stretching before her. On second thoughts... I think I ought to correct my remarks. It is not really trouble, but more a desire to confirm me in my own ideas. Well, if you feel you are right, dear girl, stand for the uplifting of the race and womanhood. Do not shrink from duty. It was simply a thought raised by your remarks on morality. I once knew a woman who had sinned. No one in the community in which she lived knew it but herself. She married a man who would have despised her had he known her story, but, as it is, she is looked upon as a pattern of virtue for all women. "'And then what?' asked Mrs. Willis, with a searching glance at the fair face beside her. "'Ought she not to have told her husband before marriage? Was it not her duty to have thrown herself upon his clemency?' "'I think not,' replied Mrs. Willis dryly. "'See here, my dear.' I am a practical woman of the world, and I think your young woman built wiser than she knew. I am of the opinion that most men are like the lower animals in many things. They don't always know what is for their best good. If the husband had been left to himself, he probably would not have married the one woman in the world best fitted to be his wife. I think in her case she did her duty. Ah, oh, that word duty! "'What is our duty?' queried the girl, with a sad droop to the sensitive mouth. "'It is so hard to know our duty. "'We are told that all hidden things shall be revealed. "'Must repented and atoned for sin rise at last to be our curse?' "'Here is a point, dear girl. "'God does not look upon the constitution of sin as we do. "'His judgment is not ours. "'Ours is finite. "'His infinite.' Your duty is not to be morbid, thinking these thoughts that have puzzled older heads than yours. Your duty is, also, to be happy and bright for the good of those about you. Just blossom like the flowers, have faith and trust. At this point the entrance of the men made an interruption, and Mrs. Willis disappeared in a crowd of other matrons. Sappho was impressed in spite of herself by the woman's words. She sat buried in deep thought. There was evidently more in this woman than appeared upon the surface. 
with all the centuries of civilization and culture that have come into this grand old world no man has yet been found able to trace the windings of god's inscrutable ways there are men and women whose seeming uselessness fit perfectly into the warp and woof of destiny's web all things work together for good supper being over the elderly people began to leave it was understood that after nine o'clock the night belonged to the young people a committee had been formed from among them to plan for their enjoyment and they consulted with ma smith in the kitchen as to the best plan of procedure the case is this said the chairman who was also the church chorister ma smith has bought four gallons of ice cream to be sold for the benefit of this fair it's got to go and it rests with us to devise ways and means of getting rid of it get up a dance suggested sam washington a young fellow who was the life of all social functions dance exclaimed ma smith not in this house the choir-master surreptitiously kicked Sam on the shins, as he said soothingly, "'Under the circumstances I see no other way, as we've got to sell the cream, and there's no harm in dancing anyway.' "'You ain't going to object to our dancing, are you, Ma? It's all old fogeyism about dancing being a sin,' chimed in Sam. "'Oh, but my son, I've been a church member over thirty years, a consistent Christian, and I never was up before the board for behavior unbecoming a professor. Think of the disgrace on me if the church took it up,' she expostulated tearfully. "'Look here, Ma, the deacons and ministers are all fooling you. It's the style for church members to go to the theater and the circus, to balls and everything you can mention.' "'Why, I've seen our own pastor up to see the black crook, "'and laughing like all possessed at the sights. "'Fact!' "'Why, Samuel,' said Ma Smith, "'how can you stand there and tell me such awful stories?' "'Not a bit of a story,' declared the brazen-faced Sam. "'It's as true as gospel. "'I'll find out what seat the minister gets next June "'when the circus comes into town, "'and I'll get a seat for you right behind him.' "'If you've never been to the circus, Ma, and to see the seven-headed lady and the dancing mokes, "'you ought to go as soon as possible. Think of the fun you're missin'. "'Oh!' groaned the good woman in holy horror. "'How you do go on!' "'But that ain't nothing to the ice-cream,' continued Sam. "'And them girls in there have got to be warmed up, or the cream will be left, "'and there won't be a thing doin' when the committee calls for the money.' "'That's so,' replied Ma Smith, beginning to weaken in her opposition." "'Well, mother,' said Will, who had been an amused listener to the dialogue, "'we'll have the dance, and it shall be my dance for my company. "'No one shall trouble you. You will have nothing to do with it.' "'Well, if you say so, Willie, it's all right,' replied his mother with a fond smile. "'You are master in this house.' In the meantime the furniture in the parlors had been moved out by the other members of the committee, and in one corner a set of whist players were enjoying themselves at ten cents a head for a thirty-minute game, which ended at the stroke of a small silver bell, their places being taken by others. Already it was getting very warm in the crowded rooms. The doors leading to the entry had been thrown open, and couples were finding seats in convenient nooks waiting for dancing to begin. The girls were thinking of ice-cream. Rev. Tommy James gravitated toward Mrs. Davis's corner. She had not gone out with the other matrons. "'I enjoy a real good time as much as anybody, children,' she said. "'And when it comes to dancing, you can't lose your Aunt Hannah.' The Rev. Tommy was always at his ease with Mrs. Davis. She led him along paths which caused him no embarrassment." He knew that she looked up to him because of his education and his clerical dignity. On his side, he admired her rugged common sense, which put him at his ease, and banished the last atom of his ladylike bashfulness. Early in the winter he had been brought to realize the nature of his feeling for Mrs. Davis by seeing Brother Silas Ham, recently left a widower, and having ten children, making a decided stampede in the widow's direction. Rev. Tommy was grieved. To be sure, she was old enough to be his mother, but she had many good points to be considered. She was a good worker, experienced in married life and ways of making a man comfortable. 
then her savings must be considered. When Tommy reached this last point, he always felt sure that she was the most desirable woman in the world for a young minister. He felt hopeful to-night, because he had seen Brother Ham and his bride in church the Sunday before. Mrs. Davis opened the conversation by speaking of the bride and groom. "'Ham and his bride looked mighty comfortable in church, didn't they?' "'He did. I'm glad he's settled again. It's not good for a man to be alone.' "'Deed, I'm glad, too.' "'You... well... well, I'm real glad to hear you say it.' "'What for?' asked the widow coyly, looking down and playing with her fan. "'I... I didn't know how you and Brother Ham stood.' "'Stood? Well, I never.' "'I thought Brother Ham had been trying to get you,' whispered Tommy, sitting closer and putting his arm across the back of her chair." "'Law, sirs, Mr. Jeems, how nervous you does make me. Do take your arm away. Everybody'll be a-lookin' at you, honey. I'm surprised at your thinkin' I'd look at Ham and all them chillin. Massy knows what the woman he's got's gwine to do with em.' But she looked so mild and smiling that Tommy went into the seventh heaven of delight, and so lost his head that when he heard the call, "'Another couple wanted here!' He took Mrs. Davis on his arm and stood upon the floor, forgetful of the fact that he was within a few months of his ordination. A good-natured matron, not connected with the church, had volunteered to supply the lack of an orchestra. Waltzing was soon in full blast, and the demand on the ice-cream cans was filling Ma Smith's heart with joy, tempered with inward stings of conscience and fear of the steward's board. Dora was dancing assiduously and eating ice-cream at John's expense, he meantime saying that if she kept on she would turn into a frozen dainty, to say nothing of a frost in his pocket-book. Dora declared that it was for the good of the cause, and he'd just got to stand it. She was wildly happy because of the tender familiarity between her brother and her friend. A long-stemmed rose that Will wore in his buttonhole had been transferred to Sappho's corsage. Dora smiled as she caught the half-puzzled, half-wondering expression on her mother's face. It was approaching twelve o'clock when it was proposed to wind up the festivities with the good old Virginie reel. Sam Washington was the caller, and did his work with the fancy touch peculiar to a poetic southern temperament. He was shrewd and good-natured, and a bit of a wag. He knew all the secret signs of the ladies and their attendant swains. A lively girl whom everyone called Ginny remarked to Sam, referring to the fact that Sam was on probation, "'Your class leader won't recommend you to the board for membership after to-night.' "'Now, Ginny,' replied Sam, stopping in his business of arranging couples, "'don't make yourself obnoxious bringing up unpleasant subjects. I'll take my medicine like a man when the time comes, but I'd bust show if I didn't get loose to-night. I'm in good company, too, he grinned, nodding toward Reverend Tommy and Mrs. Davis, who were just taking their places on the floor. If this is good for Tommy, it's good enough for me. All reserve was broken down in the instant the familiar strains of the Virginia reel were heard. The dance was soon in full swing, and up and down, dead and earnest, seeking for a good time, and a determination to have it if it was to be got. It was a vehement, rhythmic thump, thump, thumpity thump, with a great stamping of the feet and cutting of the pigeon wing. Sam had provided himself with the lively Jinny for a partner, and was cutting grotesque juba figures in the pauses of the music, to the delight of the company. His partner, in wild vivacity, fairly vied with him in his efforts at doing the hoe-down and the heel-and-toe. Not to be outdone, the Reverend Tommy James and Mrs. Davis scored great hits in cutting pigeon-wings and reviving forgotten beauties of the walk-round. Tommy allowed he hadn't enjoyed himself so much since he'd came up north. "'Yes,' said Sam, "'this beats the cake-walk all holler. Now then, one more turn and we're done.' Forward on the head, balance your partner, swing the next gent, swing that lady. Now swing your rose, your pretty rose, your yaller rose of Texas. All promenade. Everybody declared it had been a wonderful evening. 
"'Thank the Lord it's over,' said Ma Smith to Mrs. Sarah Ann White, who was helping her in the kitchen. "'Well,' said the latter, pausing in her work with her arms akimbo, "'sech sights as I've seen to-night I never would have believed. Felia Davis, what ought to be a mother in Jerusalem, kicking up her heels in your parlor like a colt in a cornfield, and that Tommy Jeems, no more fitting for a minister than a sucking babe, but traipsing after her like a bald-headed rooster.' End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of Contending Forces by Pauline E. Hopkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine Love Took Up the Harp of Life. Love took up the glass of time and turned it in his glowing hands, every moment lightly shaken, ran itself in golden sands. Love took up the harp of life and smote on all the chords with might. Tennyson. Will Smith sat the next evening in his room, trying to engage his mind and chain his wandering thoughts upon an important prize thesis. As a brilliant philosophical student destined to shine in the future in the world of science, he had been requested to become a competitor for the prize. Ever and anon his attention wavered, and finally he threw his books and papers to one side with a sigh, and, rising to his feet, paced the floor impatiently. Two soft eyes looked into his. The low music of a gentle voice seemed all about him. "'Pshaw!' he exclaimed impatiently. "'I have laughed at others only to become more of a driveling idiot than any of the men I have ridiculed. I never thought mere beauty in a woman could move me so.' The smile induced by pleasant thoughts lingered on his face as he threw himself upon his couch and tried to bring order out of the chaos of his thoughts. Smith's hopes were all for a finishing course at college, and then a course in philosophy at some good German university. Philosophy was a mania with him. In vain had bishops and clergymen of all denominations warned him that his mania might become a passion which would draw him from a right conception of the word, and dull his appreciation of the beauties of revelation. Will contended that religion and the natural laws were not antagonistic, and that being convinced and thoroughly grounded in his faith, he but discovered fresh evidence of infinite perfection in the doctrine of his master when he sought to expand his faculties and illuminate his mind by seeking a clearer perception of the interesting relation which weak humanity bears to the glorious mysteries of life and the grandeurs of creation. He laughed at the idea of Latin and Greek being above the caliber of the negro and likely to unfit him for the business of bread-getting in the peculiar position in life to which the negro, as maintained by some, was destined from the beginning. With him Latin and Greek represented but tools which he used to unlock the storehouse of knowledge. The development of his race was a matter of first importance to his mind. The only way to bring the best faculties of the negro to their full fruition, he contended, was by the careful education of the moral faculties along the lines of the natural laws. No negro college, he argued, ought to bestow a diploma upon a man or woman who had not been thoroughly grounded in the rudiments of moral and natural philosophy, physiology, and political economy. At twenty-five Smith found himself about to realize his hopes. He was fitted to enter Harvard University and graduate after a short course there. His articles in local magazines had attracted the favorable notice of scientific men, and one wealthy gentleman had offered him a course at Heidelberg after graduation. Emerson's words on character were an apt description of the strong personality of this man a reserved force which acted directly by its presence and without apparent means. His sister's friends possessed no attraction for him. He treated them as little girls, looking down upon them from the superior height of his twenty-five years with a gentle condescension, tempered always by the natural chivalry of a generous nature toward the weak and helpless. He was a favorite with women, old and young, in spite of his careless, half-haughty ways. 
many a sigh was wafted after his handsome, unconscious self, as a pretty maiden who had fancied that she had at length conquered the unconquerable, saw her chains fall from him as lightly as a cobweb is brushed away. What had come to him now at the glance of a soft, fawn-like eye, the touch of a hand, a caressing smile, the sound of a sweet voice? Sappho had been with them two months, but Will felt that he must have known her for years. Suddenly he passed from youth to manhood, and realized man's destiny. He had assisted his mother and sister with happy pride, but now the desire to shield, to protect, to love one being supremely above all others, rose and surged within him with a mighty strength. Although love had come to Smith like a flood sweeping all barriers before it, yet the very strength of his desire for her love but served to restrain decided action. He approached the desired end slowly and carefully, not to defeat his own plans. He was well aware that Sappho's nature was a rare one, dwelling much upon lonely heights, the home of extraordinary moral sensitiveness and high intellectual development. Again he saw her advancing toward him in the mazes of the dance. Her hand lay in his, her soft hair brushed his face, her sweet breath came to him from smiling rose-leaf lips, and intoxicated his senses. The star-like beauty of immortal eyes, fringed by long curling lashes, flashed at him from the four corners of his dingy room. What tender thrills of sympathetic feeling had seemed to enfold his senses as he gazed into their limpid depths! What beauty and strength lurked in the mobile, sweetly smiling mouth! The delicately molded chin, on which the god of love had left his impress, might have served as the model for a sculptor. She and no other should be his wife, God willing. Propinquity is responsible for many matches. It was pleasant for Sappho, when she returned mornings from delivering her work, to find her fire burning briskly and the room well warmed. It was a comfort to her not to have the ugly problem of ashes, wood, and coal to solve. Not that she was too proud, or that she thought housework of any kind beneath her, but what woman does not feel it a relief to find the machinery of the home running smoothly without her aid? She thought nothing about ways and means, taking it for granted that there was nothing unusual in finding things pleasant, and she congratulated herself on being so fortunate in having heat included in Ma Smith's modest charges for lodging. Upon her return one morning, as she mounted the stairs to her room, she saw from the light reflected that her door was open. Someone within the room was singing in a fine baritone voice a verse of an old song. Of all the days that are in the week, I dearly love but one day. That is the day that comes between Saturday and Monday. For then I dress in all my best, and roam with my dear Sally. She's the darling of my heart, and she lives in our alley. She pushed the door open and entered. Her cheeks were glowing from her walk in the bracing morning air, but her face assumed a serious, questioning look as she discovered Will just finishing up his self-imposed morning task. He gave an extra flourish to the brushes to cover his confusion and annoyance, and kept right on polishing off the little heater with his dubious-looking black cloths well filled with stove-polish. "'Well!' she exclaimed. "'Good morning,' returned Will, with a business-like flourish of his cloth, as, having finished the stove, he proceeded to touch up the bright piece of zinc under it. "'How will she take it?' he asked himself. "'Well,' she repeated. "'Quite well, thank you,' said Will, this time with a quizzical grin on his face. "'I had no idea you were the fireman, Mr. Smith.' "'No. In the words of Dr. Peters, I'd do most anything in the world, honey, to get a honest livin' without stealin' it. Will had donned one of his mother's ample kitchen aprons for the protection of his clothing. The bib was pinned well up in front across the broad expanse of shirt bosom. The ample folds of the apron skirt enveloped his limbs to the ankles. The long strings, crossed in the back, met in front in a huge bow-knot. 
There was a streak of smut across one eye, and the side of his nose was polished to perfection. The picture was too much for Sappho, and peal after peal of laughter shook her slight frame. "'Oh, Mr. Smith,' she said, when she could find breath, "'you do look so funny.' "'Twas ever thus from childhood's hour,' quoted Will, marching up to the mirror to survey his beauty spots. "'I do look rather fetching,' he continued, with a confidential smile at his laughing companion. "'Do you do this every day?' asked Sappho, suddenly sobering down. "'Do what every day?' "'Why, make my fire.' "'It's not your fire any more than any one else's fire.' "'I'm very sorry.' "'Sorry? Sorry about what? It isn't a crime, is it, for a man to make a fire for his women folks? "'But I'm not your women folks.' "'Look here,' said Will, in an aggrieved tone, balancing a hod of ashes in one hand and a pile of stove-brushes in the other. "'Are we going to quarrel?' "'There is no reason why we should agree,' said Sappho, smiling gravely. "'That means that we shan't quarrel if I agree to whatever you're going to propose.' "'What is it you want to say?' he asked, becoming grave in his turn. "'Is it that I have behaved unmanly in visiting your room in your absence? "'Why cavil about a little thing of that sort? "'I do this for you as I would for Dora.' "'Oh, if you look at it that way,' she began, a trifle confused by his apparent unconsciousness. "'How else ought I to look at it?' "'How horrid you are!' "'Horrid? I don't see what I've said that is so very dreadful.' "'You speak so, well, so cross.' "'I speak like a man talking to a silly girl.' "'Now you are rude again, calling me names.' "'Children must be kept in their places,' he said banteringly. "'You're making fun of me.' "'Of course I am. What do you expect?' "'But you mustn't make my fire again.' "'I'm sorry you found it out. I didn't intend you to know it. I can't pay for having the work done, and it is not proper for you to do it. There's no reason why you should do such work for me. Suppose we play that you are my other sister. That will make it all right, won't it? No, came firmly from Sappho's lips. No more fires. See here, I've hit it. Play I'm your father. Ridiculous. What, neither brother nor father? How'd it do to imagine that you're my mother? You can't find fault with that, surely. How silly you are! No like me for Sonny? queried Will, with a sad shake of his head. If you don't leave this room instantly, William Smith, I'll call your mother, replied Sappho, laughing in spite of herself. The best play, though, would be Sweethearts, he continued, as though she had not spoken. Sweethearts? "'Yes, sweethearts, and I believe I could win the game, too, in spite of your reserve.' "'You must be very sure of your power, young man. You need a lesson in diffidence.' He held her gaze for a moment, and there was so much earnestness in the persistent dark eyes that she blushed furiously. He turned and abruptly left the room. No more was said about the fire— but Will continued to perform common everyday duties for her, the same as for his sister. She did her part, too. Many an evening he found her helping Dora, darning socks or replacing lost buttons. Will's manner had changed toward her from that day. From easy familiarity it changed to a mixture of timid reserve and marked deference. Sappho noticed it, but somehow she liked it better. It spoke to her silently of tender, sacred thoughts. Tonight he thought of the scene just pictured as he sat there in his room. She and none other should be his wife, God willing. In another part of the house, Ma Smith sat before the fire in her chamber and meditated on many things. The knitting with which the busy hands were always engaged when at leisure dropped in her lap and lay there unheeded. She thought of the incident of Sappho and the rose of the night before, and the merry, teasing look that had flashed out at her for one instant from Dora's laughing eyes. Could it be possible that she was about to lose her son? Dora's engagement to John Langley had been a source of great satisfaction to her. The old-fashioned notion was still strong within her that it was the right destiny for girls to marry, 
and that the only cause for a mother to grieve in the idea of marriage for her daughter was the awful chance of that daughter's remaining single. The girl's life should be lost in that of the wife and mother. Such an end to maidenhood was a happy achievement for the girl and a glory to her family. But with her boy it was different. He was her firstborn, and memory was busy to-night with the past. Her will with a wife, herself a grandmother, to renew at this age the joys which had been hers when he first lay within her arms a soft morsel of humanity with sweet brown face and melting black eyes that mirrored themselves within the citadel of her heart. Ma Smith had known so much sorrow in her life. She could tell you of hard times when it seemed that the combined efforts of her husband and herself would not avail to keep the wolf from the door. She knew what it was to bake and brew, to mend and make over, to minister to the needs of childhood with increasing maternal cares near at hand. With all this, the offered work which added a few dollars to their little store was always gladly accepted. But she would tell you also that she would not have given one hour of those days with all their privations for the happiness that she enjoyed when in the privacy of a humble home she counted her precious jewels, an honest husband and two beautiful children. Yes, she was wont to say, we had a hard time, and sometimes the waters of affliction seemed about to sweep us from our foothold, but somehow just when everything was darkest we could see the light of prosperity shining through the clouds, and we would take courage, bless the Lord, and keep on struggling. Tonight she lived those struggles over again, and tried to imagine what it would be to have another share the love and reverence of the idolized son. At first it seemed that she could not endure the thought, but then she remembered how happy she had been in her married life, and prayed the Lord to deliver her from selfish desires. Who was she to stand in the way of her son's happiness, a son whom she loved? Sappho Clark was beautiful. She believed her to be a girl of exemplary conduct. Sappho was always deferential to her, giving to the elder woman the gentle deference which, coming from youth, is so dear to those advanced in years. So, with a heart overflowing with love, and filled with kind and tender thoughts, it was no mystery where the pretty old face had caught its added charm of heavenly brightness. So Dora found her when she returned from spending the evening with some young friends. "'Why, Mummy dear, I declare you are growing younger and handsomer every day. We girls must look to our laurels if you keep on growing so pretty.' "'Well, my love, I have been thinking of your father to-night, and how happy we were when you and Will were wee tots.' Dora knew well what had set her mother thinking. She appreciated her feelings. She knew that her mother had always felt that no woman could be good enough for Will's wife. She felt instinctively that her mother had faced the difficulty alone that evening, and conquered it, effacing herself and her desires for the happiness of her son. With her usual impulsiveness, Dora threw herself on her knees beside her mother's chair, and drawing her face down to her, kissed the wrinkled brow, and smoothed the soft white hair. "'Mummy, dear,' she said, you have made your mind up to give him up to Sappho if things turn out that way? Yes, my dear, replied her mother, with her hand upon the dark braids beside her. I will not say that it was not a struggle, but mothers know, if they stop to think, that they must lose their babies some time. Your father and I made a home for ourselves, so I must look forward to the time when the young birds will want to build a nest away from me. "'But what is the matter with you, Dora? You look worried. Is anything wrong?' "'Oh, no,' replied the girl, as she rose from her knees by her mother's side and began putting her things away and preparing for the night. "'Isn't it strange what a queer old world this is? If you are happy, I am not, or vice versa. It does seem that one thing or another is always happening to vex a body.' and the worst of it is that it may happen that we are impatient and unhappy about things that are trivial. I don't feel sweet-tempered to-night, and, 
Really, I can't tell why. Ma Smith glanced at her daughter sharply, but said nothing, as Dora thrust her bare feet into bedroom slippers and proceeded to undo the thick masses of curling brown hair and brush and arrange it for the night. The mother knew that her daughter would unburden her mind presently, so she waited patiently. It was not like Dora to be petulant and have moods. She was a happy, healthy, active girl, with a kindly disposition. Ma, said Dora, after a silence, why is it that southern colored people seem to be so prejudiced against the northern colored people? I always fancied that we were all in the same boat, and that mere accidental locality was not to be considered. That is true, my dear, but it must be that you imagine the prejudice to exist that you mention. Surely we have outgrown such ideas as a race by this time. Dora shook her head obstinately. I fancied that the Wilsons slighted me to-night, and that they would have been better pleased if John had chosen a southern girl. You're oversensitive, Dora. Dora did not reply, and after a moment's silence continued. John said that he had not met a decent-looking woman who was northern-born, and that when he did see a pretty colored girl on the street he knew without asking that she was a southerner. That was rather thoughtless in John, but I don't think he meant to hurt your feelings, daughter. I cannot imagine what has gotten into him lately. He's not like himself. Oh, I do wish I was handsome like Sappho Clark. All the men are wild over her. "'Well, my dear, you don't harbor hard feelings against Sappho on that account, do you? That would not be like you, Dora, and would grieve me very much. Sappho is the best and dearest girl on earth, and I only hope that Will may be so lucky as to marry her. And, Mummy, I hope that Will will speak to her right off, so as to get the matter straightened out. There won't be a blessed man left to us girls if she remains single long.' Her mother smiled. "'Daughter,' I want to say just a word to you about our conversation. Don't allow jealousy to lurk in your heart. Don't brood over unkind words. Cast them from you. And I would have you remember also that sectional prejudice has always been fostered by the southern whites among the negroes to stifle natural feelings of brotherly love among us. Dissension means disunion. Carry these thoughts always in your mind and act accordingly. Do not allow yourself to be made unhappy. Meanwhile, on the floor above them, Sappho turned restlessly on her pillow, thinking of a noble head and bright dark eyes. She knew that Will Smith loved her. What woman does not feel the subtle intertwining of a kindred spirit linked to her own by the decree of destiny, long years perhaps before either restless soul has entered upon its earthly pilgrimage? She was not happy in her knowledge. Under cover of the friendly darkness she gave up the long struggle for self-control, and indulged in the grief that she knew was hers for all eternity. Oh, for death, the solitude of the grave, and self-forgetfulness! What have I done? What have I done to suffer thus? To give up all joy, and have only misery for all my life? I love this man, I know it now. I want his love, his care, his protection. I want him through life and beyond the grave, we two as one, my husband. Oh, my God, help me, help me. Heavy sobs shook her frame. Broken exclamations fell from her lips. I cannot, it must not be. So good, so noble! Oh, the happiness of home and love! Must I be shut from them forever? Far into the night the agony of sobs continued. At last, with a murmured prayer for help, she fell asleep. End of chapter 9「Chapter 10 of Contending Forces by Pauline E. Hopkins this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10. The Fair Boisterous jest and humor unrefined, That leave, though rough, no painful sting behind. Warm social joys surround the negro's cot. No ennui clouds, no coming cares annoy, 
nor wants nor sorrows check the negro's joy. The days went on apace at No. 500 D Street, but a spirit of restlessness seemed to pervade the atmosphere. Expectancy was on tiptoe. Every one was absorbed in preparations for the fair. Such a time had not been known for years among the colored people. Every available individual was pressed into the service. Naturally, many factions had arisen, and a fierce but friendly rivalry divided the different societies within the church. Some of these were none too cordial to the outsiders who had joined them, and whom they dubbed in derision the colored four hundred. "'I'd just like to know,' said Sister Mary Jane Robinson, with a hand on each hip, "'I'd just like to know who asked the four hundred for any of their help. I've been a member here for more'n thirty years, and this church has lived without em. This was one morning directly after service, while the good sisters were waiting for class to begin. As the fair was the all-absorbing topic at present, conversation naturally ended in going over all the interesting details connected with it. "'Law, Sis Robinson, what moral difference does it make as long as the church gets the money?' The more helpers we has, the easier it makes for weans, replied Sister Scott, as she endeavored to pour oil on the troubled waters. Sister Robinson was a veritable firebrand. She spoke first, and thought afterwards. "'There's that Mrs. Willis with her high church notions,' continued Sister Robinson. "'Sister Smith has made her president of the Fine Arts and Fancy Work Department.' "'Weren't any of the members of this church good enough? "'And didn't they know enough, did they, to tend to that business? "'There's that piano and that silver set "'and that our gold watch and chain that's going to be voted for. "'If that stuff don't be left right here in this church, "'there's going to be trouble. "'And as for that diamond pin that's to go to the one "'who sells the most admission tickets, "'well, now, if the hard-working sisters of this church "'that sweats over the wash-tub earning and honest living don't deserve it, "'then what's the matter? "'Yes, I wants to know what's the matter.' "'Here the irate woman sawed the air with hand and arm "'as she laid down the law on the back of the nearest settee. "'By this time a group of sisters, attracted by her loud tones, "'had gathered around, anxious to learn what the trouble could be.' "'Well, honey,' said one meek-looking woman, "'don't let's borrow trouble. "'The way the committee has fixed the business, "'I can't see how there can be any monkey in "'with the voting or selling of the tickets. "'I do declare, my dear, "'I think the right ones will get the prizes.' "'I'm a-doing my level best,' "'said another sister with hands hard and horny with toil. "'I'm a-doing my level best to get that diamond pin for my Mandy.' I've got William Vanderbilt and Charles Sumner Astor Gould and the twins all out selling tickets among my white people. And I tell you, sisters, you's all going to have a hard time to get away with your Aunt Hannah Jackson this time. The family's surname was Jackson, but Mrs. Jackson liked to name her children for all the celebrities that she heard of, and sometimes it made a bewildering combination when one found that William Vanderbilt was represented by a sprightly little negro boy with crispy hair and bead-like black eyes. "'That silver service is just my size,' here chimed in another sister, "'and it's going hard with any one what tries to get it away from me. I'm selling tickets to beat the band. I've done picked out a sideboard for it down to Osgood's. I can get it for a dollar down and a dollar a week, and expect to have it if it takes me all the summer and winter to pay for it. Talking about the prizes, ain't you? spoke up another sister who had just joined the group. That gold watch and chain is just what Jim Anderson wants. Jim, I says to him, thou's your chance for a good easy way to get your watch. He's just raising heaven and earth a getting votes for hisself. "'Hope you won't all be disappointed,' here Sister Robinson broke in again. "'But if yer listens to me, you'll watch them high-toned color folks you all's been gettin' to help you. "'They never come round people that they don't hold on equality with their selves, that a mean southern. "'These educated folks is allers lookin' to make somethin'. "'Most of them's too lazy to work. "'They wouldn't tetch a flat iron or a wash-tub with a ten-foot pole, "'and they'd rather live on dried codfish for a month than do their own scrubbing. 
if any of them white folksy colored ladies gets them prizes i'm goin for to take out my letter and put my work into some church what will appreciate it you hear me now sisters chimed in the meek one again none of yer ain't said a word about trying to get one of those prizes for your pastor i do think that's a little bit selfish in us suppose we give him the piano huh grunted sister robinson when i jine this church i jine the meetin house and not the minister i reckon he can just look out for hisself sides he's got a organ and don't need a piano he gets his celery don't he she queried as she glared at the group about her taking their silence for consent she continued in a firm voice he's too much everything to everybody and that wife of his'n is too white for me i used to be takin fresh eggs and ham and chickens out to that house all the time but recently i's been reasonin with myself and i came to the conclusion that i won't do it no more can't tell what is the matter with these colored men a good wholesome lookin colored woman with kinky hair don't stand no livin chance to get a decent lookin man for a husband and i for one am a settin my face agin them men pretty much so pretty much so came from various ones in the group lord knows sis robinson said sister scott maybe you is right and if there's any monkeyin goin on we's all goin to sport you in whatever you think's the best course all right replied sister robinson considerably mollified by this concession i'll just take good care that none of us gets imposed on felia davis and sarah ann white has got charge of the fectionary table and the salads but if i don't knock em silly with roast pig corn dodgers and biled cabbage then i'm a sinner sister robinson walked away followed by a number of admiring satellites sister scott and sister jackson were left alone good lord said sister scott to sister jackson good lord mandy jackson did you hear mary jane robinson talk there ain't nothin the matter with her only she's afraid that somebody's gwine to haul the money draw fastened agin her i tell yer them four hundred folks she's runnin will keep a close watch on her and how much money she takes in at the old southern dinner table you hear me and i for one am glad of it replied sister jackson mary jane robinson thinks she owns this church and every one in it since mr jacobs left john robinson that five hundred dollars and they bought that house out of town bless your soul honey that's just so i never see what a little posterity makes some people have a swell head i tell you honey we better all of us keep our eye on the money draw when folks gets to buyin houses um child watch em on monday evening the fair opened at five o'clock in the morning all the women who could get there made their appearance at the church where the janitor was waiting to receive them the first floor of the building contained a large lecture room three classrooms the pastor's study a dining room and a kitchen each chairman of a committee had a certain space assigned to her by ma smith then that committee took charge and proceeded to beautify the spot and arrange their wares for inspection ice cream oysters salads and temperance drinks were to be served in a fairy-like grotto formed by grouping evergreen trees together among the trees small tables were to be set making a charming solitude adieu electricity cunningly concealed in rose-colored shades was to furnish the lighting pretty girl waiters in white dresses and fancy caps completed a fascinating picture this section was under the immediate direction of mrs ophelia davis and mrs sarah ann white you hear me sarah ann said ophelia davis to her friend you hear me that mary jane robinson means trouble she's down on the aristocracy she don't tend to give the minister a show over them prizes and you and me's got to keep a whip hand over her somehow the minister's going to get a new suit of clothes out of this and you and me's going to have that piano lord knows whether there'll be one brick of this church left on another when this fair's done but she ain't gwine to walk on me you hear me i'm a-studyin for her and if she runs up agin me there'll be trouble meanwhile mrs robinson and her coterie stood around and looked at the unique ideas for a fair which had been developed and wondered how it was that the four hundred people and their followers 
always had such a happy knack of getting everything just right. Her committee had intended to have nothing but a plain dining-room, but after seeing the gorgeous display made by Mrs. Davis and Mrs. White, a hurried meeting was called to consult about ways and means of defeating the enemy. All the other women stopped their work, too, and came to admire the effects gained by the introduction of the lights and the tete-a-tete tables. "'A very happy thought,' said Mrs. Willis, as she glanced approvingly about her. "'Where did you get the idea?' "'I got it up to Miss Mason's when Molly Mason was married.' "'That's where you lived so long, wasn't it, Mrs. Davis?' asked one of the girls, as she paused a moment in her work of arranging festoons of evergreens, and stood back to note the effect. "'I lived there and nowhere else the first fifteen years I was up north,' replied Mrs. Davis proudly. "'Were they very wealthy? Do you ever see them nowadays?' asked Mrs. Willis. "'Miss Mason was worth her millions, and Molly was her only child,' replied Mrs. Davis, now fairly launched on her favorite subject. The Mason wedding had passed into a proverb among the young people who were acquainted with Mrs. Davis. "'You see, when Molly was married, Miss Mason took it into her head to have a caterer from Boston do the work of feeding the guests. She was living in Worcester then. Even the servants were invited to the wedding.' She had a house that matched her money, you may just reckon, and the whole of her lawn was used for feeding and for dancing. There were two acres of land, nothing but lawn, and all among the trees you could see little tables set out and plenty of lanterns, although in the dancing pavilion they just connected a gas pipe with the main one and had the place lit with gas just as if you was in the house. "'You ought to ask them to contribute to the fair and help you out with your table,' remarked Mrs. Willis. Mrs. Davis cocked her head on one side and said, with a knowing wink at Mrs. Willis, "'Now ain't you talkin', honey, and maybe I ain't writ to her and told her all about Mary Jane Robison. Just you hold on, child, till you sees me paralyze her.' "'Did you go to the wedding, Mrs. Davis?' asked Sappho, who, being something of a stranger, did not know all the little points about the wedding. "'Who, me?' exclaimed Mrs. Davis. "'Yes, am I just did. Lord, child, but Miss Mason's a lady born. She don't know how to be like some of your northern people. Sure, these ladies up here are so afraid that the black'll rub off.' Down south the big white folks has nursed so many black mammies that they don't know nothing else for their children. It don't matter how black you is if you're willing to keep in the mud. Up here it's different. You can do all right and live all right, but don't put your hand on a white man or woman, or they'll have a fit for fear the black'll rub off. I suppose you went to the wedding dressed to kill, said one of the girls. Lord, child, I had to have a new light silk for that, I tell you. And such a time as I had when I went to get me a pair of patent leather shoes. Clorinda gal, she said to a young woman who was placing trees in position, what kind of way do you call that to put them trees? You ain't got a bit of eye for being an artist. Your perpendicular is all crooked. Bring me a chair thou, some one you gals, and let me fix that tree right. Having straightened out the matter of the trees, she returned panting and puffing to the refreshment bar. As I was saying, that man said he didn't have a shoe in the shop that would fit me. I told him I knowed better. He just said that cause I was a colored woman. Then he went to the show window and took out a pair, and told me to set down and he'd try em on me and see if they'd do, and if they would I might have em, and he'd get another pair that'd do for signs just as well as them. I told him I didn't care a bit if they was signs. Why didn't he trot em out when I asked for em first? Well, he says, they's number elevens, and I didn't want to insult you. Insult nothing, says I, as long as I can get em on. They fitted me all right, only they kind of cramped me across my bunion. I always has a hard time with that dratted bunion of mine. I managed to wear em, though I'm free to say that I never felt as though I got my money out of the plaguey things. As I was saying, I was cook, and the second girl was colored too. We just hired an open barouche to drive to the church in. I believe in doing things right, 
and i tell you the white folks was dumb when we drove up that night to the church door and stepped out of the carriage on to the strip of carpet under the yawning for all the world just like quality we got long all right till we struck the entry then sally kind of hung back when she saw a big usher looking for all the world like a picture book standing there telling us to wait our turn to be seated in the family pew yes indeed bless your soul miss mason had done put us into one of the family pews i'm used to them sort of things myself but you see sally she's kind of low down corn shucker not used to nothin tall and i kept my eye on to her i could see it into her face that she intended to give me the slip and bolt and hide herself oh miss davis says she has we got to walk all the way up that aisle with one of them white gentlemen yes sally we has and it won't kill us nother to be like live gentry for once in our lives just then one of them made for me and i only had time to whisper brace up sally and be a woman when i found myself walking up the aisle on that white man's arm as big as cuffy and a sweatin to beat the band what became of sally asked sappho bless your soul miss sappho when she saw at me she just broke and run down them steps plumb into the street and made tracks for the house all dressed as she was in white chiffon and when i got back there she was a-standin up in the middle of the kitchen floor grinnin like a chessy cat miss davis says she miss davis i wouldn't a walked up that church aisle with that white gentleman for a thousand dollars deed i wouldn't i was so mad with that fool gal that i just itched to spank her well how do we vance any if we don't brace our tunities i'd like to know all the committees worked willingly and soon every one of the departments had been provided with appropriate enclosures like quaint pictures set in exquisite frames the bare walls disappeared and the whole place burst into beauty bewildering enough to draw the money from the pockets of the spectators who would come with the evening to help a worthy charity mrs robinson with her old-fashioned busy bees as they called themselves had hurriedly decorated the dining-room with american flags and christian endeavor banners the long white-covered tables looked very inviting and the motherly women in black dresses white aprons and bandana handkerchiefs tied into fantastic head coverings added another charm which their soft southern accent completed late in the afternoon the tired workers examined the results of their labors with much satisfaction End of chapter ten Chapter Eleven of Contending Forces by Pauline E. Hopkins. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven The Fair Concluded. In feasts, maturing busy hands appear, and jest and laugh assail the ready ear. On Monday evening at seven p.m., the doors of the fair were opened. In the center of the hall the prize piano was advantageously placed, and Dora, as the organist of the church, displayed its merits in a few well-chosen numbers. There were selections given also by a banjo, guitar, and mandolin club of local reputation. Cozily ensconced behind a bower of tropical plants and flowers, they discoursed popular selections in a manner which displayed most favorably the really fine musical ability which each one of them possessed. In another corner of the hall, under a tent which represented an Indian lodge, was a great and mysterious attraction, Madame Francis, spiritualistic soothsayer and marvelous mind-reader, had offered her services to the committee, and would send out bulletins at so much a letter, on subjects supposed to be unknown to all the world but the persons themselves. The young people were in a flutter over this particular feature, the men no less so than the women. Who could tell what might happen through her agency? Long-delayed questions might be asked, unknown feelings might be revealed to anxious hearts. One might buy a lucky charm and present it to his enamorata, and by contact with it her coldness should vanish. Henry might receive a letter whose sweet perfume should banish the thoughts of Susan and turn his wandering heart to its first allegiance. 
O oh, happy race, which even now, when life is but a bare existence, though torn by howling mobs and scourged by fire, finds pleasure in the simple pastimes of innocence. Superstition is supposed to be part of the Negro's heritage. They have brought much of it from their native Africa. It gives color, picturesqueness, light and shade, we may say, to the darkness of life and complexion which so far has marked the Negro for its own. Claiming kinship with the Egyptians and other black races of the eastern continent, the Negro is thought to possess wonderful powers of necromancy. Races are like families. The East Indian shows remarkable ability to awaken the superstitious fears of a community in his native country, so with the Egyptian, so with the Negro. But transplant them on a foreign shore, and much of their supposed power vanishes, so with the Negro. We hear much of spells and charms being put upon unpleasant neighbors, wonderful stories of lizards being taken from the leg or arm of an enemy, placed there by the arts of the voodoo doctor, and cured by the same gifted party. But if we notice these wonderful and terrorizing acts were never perpetrated against the inhuman master or mistress of the isolated plantation, never upon enemies wearing a white skin, but always upon the humble associate and brother in bondage. Be these things true or false, the negro no longer holds the distinction of being the only race that believes in the pretensions of those who claim to be able to look into the future with mesmerized sight, favored by hidden powers, that have a knowledge of coming events. In these days of palmistry, phrenology, card-reading, mind-reading, lucky pigs, rabbit's feet worn on the watch-chain for luck, and four-leaved clover encased in crystal and silver for the same reason, who shall say that the negro has not lost his monopoly of one great racial characteristic? Madame Francis was supposed to be skilled in the occult arts, which were once the glory of the freshly imported African. Wonderful tales were told of her ability to foretell the future. Her services were of great value to the managers of the fair, for her fame had been rumored abroad, through the members of the church, and it was popularly reported that some of the richest people in the city would visit the fair, if for nothing but to test the ability of this woman. And as one gazed upon her he might be pardoned for thinking that within that dark house, molded upon symmetrical lines, and appearing as though cut from purest ebony, albeit somewhat thin and spare, as became one past the meridian of life, and now upon the road leading downward into the shadows of the last valley through which we must pass on our outward journey toward the spheres of celestial light, dwelt a rare mind. How did she look? I knew a princess, she was old, crisp-haired, flat-featured, with a look, such as no dainty pen of gold would write of in a fairy book. Her face was like the sphinx's face to me, touched with vast patience, desert grace, and lonesome brooding mystery. Nothing of the loveliest loveliness this strange sad princess seemed to lack. Majestic with her calm distress, she was, and beautiful, though black. A quaint conceit which gave great pleasure to the children, big and little, was the pretty great-nephew of the seeress, who, dressed in costume, represented Mercury, and carried messages to the fortunate ones remembered by the mystic powers of futurity. Alphonse was a beautiful boy about eight years old, with golden curls and dark blue eyes that looked out on life from beneath their sweeping lashes, with a glance all too melancholy for one of his tender years. There are children who seem to have been born with the shadows of life heavy upon them. So it was with little Alphonse. He passed from groups of merry young people and pleasant elders who, attracted by the beauty of the weird child, sought to beguile him with soft caress and loving touch. He would stand quietly waiting until the speaker had finished his question, would answer carefully, 
and suffer the caresses as though accepting them as part of his duty, and would return to the tent and his aunt, evincing no desire for the frolic and fun which belongs to the golden days of childhood. Many influential whites were present in order to display their philanthropic interest in the welfare of the colored people. They gazed with surprise upon the child, and could not be convinced when told that he was a negro, and identified by ties of blood with the blackest men and women in the crowded company. In a distant corner Sappho sat, keeping a strict account of the monies received. Occasionally she would leave her seat and mingle with the crowd. Gowned in a pure white china silk with a bunch of her favorite jacks in her corsage, she moved a daughter of the gods divinely fair. And many a thought came into the heart of one learned doctor as he gazed on the child and the beautiful girl, and then upon faces ebony-hued, but bright and sparkling with the light of freedom and intelligence. In that moment a cloud passed from before his mental vision, and he beheld in all its hideousness the cankering sore which is eating into the heart of republican principles, and stamping the lie upon the Constitution. Expediency and right must go hand in hand. There is no room for compromise. Sappho was tired, and one of the young girls in her Bible class, noticing the weariness of her attitude, insisted upon assuming the duties of cashier for an hour. She gladly availed herself of the girl's offer, and turned with a sigh of relief to find a secluded seat where she could watch, unobserved, the passing of the gay throng. As she turned, a hand was laid gently on her arm, and Will Smith's gay voice sounded in her ear. "'Whither away, fair lady?' Sappho smiled back into the debonair face as she replied, "'Just to the fairy grotto to rest a while.' "'I will accompany thee, fair queen,' hummed Will, as he drew her hand within his arm, and moved slowly through the crowd toward the refreshment-room. No more was said until they reached the spot, when Will seated her at one of the most secluded tables, placing himself upon the opposite side. "'Lord love you, Sarah Ann, just see that couple,' said Mrs. Davis to Mrs. White. "'If that ain't a match, then no matter. See em look at her?' I was going to wait on them myself, and Sarah Ann, you keep these young squirts busy in some other corner. There ain't nobody going to spile sport if I can help it. Mrs. Davis bustled over to the young people and literally beamed upon them. Good evening now, Mr. Smith. What be you and Miss Sappho going to have? You see, I just came over to wait on you myself. Good evening, Mrs. Davis. You are looking as bright and charming as a rose. How are the refreshments going? Charmin responded Mrs. Davis, secretly delighted at the compliment. "'Ain't you shamed to talk like that to an old woman? You young fellows gets worse every day. Just see Miss Sappho laughing at you? Well, thank God we's doin' well to-night, took in a pile of money so far. Mary Jane Robertson thinks she's going to down me in this here refreshment room, but just you wait till Friday night.' "'What about Friday night?' asked Sappho. Nothin, only I've got a big surprise waitin' for Mary Jane Robinson. Friday will be a mighty unlucky day for Sister Robinson, huh? laughed Will. Thy won't be a thing doin' for her, honey, you'll see. I's gwine to paralyze her. I'll bet my money on you every time, Mrs. Davis, laughed Will. I have every confidence in your business sagacity. I feel sorry for Sister Robinson. "'She'll need your sorrow,' replied Mrs. Davis. "'Mary Jane Robertson's jealous, and when people gets jealous they can't do the best thing in the best place. I ain't jealous of nobody, and I's just settin' back here watchin' her kill herself, as cool as a sittin' hen. I had a letter from Miss Mason, and she knows as how she's goin' to stand by me. You know what that means, don't you, honey?' "'Oysters, coffee, ice cream, and cake for two, she murmured, repeating Will's order. "'My head's level. There aren't a thing the matter with it,' she finished, as she turned to execute the order. A silence fell between the two as they sat within the shadow of the trees, content to be with each other. Will was as happy to have the privilege of feasting his eyes upon the lovely face opposite him, 
which dimpled and blushed in such a charming manner beneath his glance. Never before had she seemed to abandon herself so completely to the influence of his passion, but to-night she laid aside her coldness, and seemed ready to accept the homage which he was longing to lay at her feet. The girl felt it. Why, she asked herself, why should I always walk in the shadow of a crime for which I am in no way to blame? Why deny myself all the pleasures of a home, and love with such a man as he who will offer me the noblest heritage of woman? The more she thought, the stronger became her resolve not to fight against fate, but to accept the goods the gods provided without question. She would rise above maddening fears, penance for involuntary wrongs, the sackcloth and ashes of her life, and be as other women— who loved and were beloved. So she smiled on Will bewitchingly. Sallies of wit and fun flashed from her pretty lips in a way which was fascinating as bewildering. Will knew her to be well educated, but had never supposed that she possessed the exquisite art of repartee. Tonight he caught glimpses of an ideal woman and wife, and the glimpse intoxicated him. Now love was kind. They had very nearly finished their lunch when the room was invaded by Dora, followed by Dr. Lewis, who had arrived from New Orleans the last of the previous week. "'Oh, here you are, Sappho. I've been looking for you everywhere. Have you had one of Madame Francis's predictions? She's creating a sensation.' "'No,' replied Sappho. "'I have not. Have you one? Is it good?' "'Yes, I have one. For my part, I think it's rubbish. Just listen,' and she read from a slip of paper in her hand. All that glistens is not gold. Often have you heard this told. Despise the false, welcome the true. So shall you receive your due. Now, whatever in the world does she mean by all that? Where's John? asked her brother rather abruptly. Has he had a message too? Yes, and he's so mad that he won't give any one a decent word, replied his sister. I'm sure, she continued, if I felt as hateful as John Langley has acted to-night, I'd stay at home. "'Do you remember how his message read?' asked her brother. "'Yes,' said Dora, "'it was something like this. He who expects gain shall lose. Be faithful to the object of your choice, or merit the fate reserved for fickleness and deceit.' "'Can't blame him for feeling wrathy over such a fortune as that, can you, Lewis?' asked Will, turning to his sister's companion. "'Gad, no,' replied the doctor. "'If he would only prove unfaithful to the object of his choice, "'how happy some other fellow might be!' "'Dora looked at her companion with scorn on her countenance. "'I just think I hate you sometimes, Arthur Lewis,' she exclaimed, "'as she turned to leave the room. "'Oh, I say, Dora, do have something before you go,' "'urged the unlucky fellow, as he followed his angry companion toward the door. "'No, I won't have anything.' I do believe you just love to see John Langley quarrel with me, but it won't do you a bit of good, Arthur Lewis, not a bit. As they vanished from sight, Will turned to Sappho and said, Dora and John worry me, Miss Clark. I fear that there is trouble ahead for my little sister if she marries him, and I could find it in my heart to wish that her choice had fallen on Lewis. He is a thoroughly good and capable man, and loves the girl devotedly. "'Let us hope that all things may turn out for the best,' replied Sappho. "'I don't know why I should worry you with this, Miss Clark,' said Will, as he turned toward her with a light in his eyes, which a man gives to but one woman in the world. "'Miss Clark, Sappho. "'Ah, here you are.' This time it was John Langley who had broken in upon the lovers. He came up to them, smiling, polished, bland— Sappho wondered why she had never noticed how very disagreeable John Langley's smile was. She shuddered a bit as he drew nearer to them. Behind him walked the little Mercury, and in his hand he held a white missive just drawn from the small black velvet bag which hung at his side. "'Mercury wanted to find you, Miss Clark, and as I had a message for you from your mother, Will, I ventured to interrupt your earnest conversation.' "'I hope I don't intrude,' he bowed with easy grace to Sappho, and bade her good evening, at the same time taking the chair which Will vacated as he rose to go to his mother. "'Thank you, John. No, you do not intrude. 
"'Miss Clark, I shall see you again shortly, I hope. I would very much like to finish our conversation.' Sappho bowed, and he turned away. She followed the retreating figure with her eyes. John watched her jealously, and the child stood and watched them both. Finally, with a sigh, she opened the note, but before reading it turned to murmur a gentle apology to Langley. "'Oh, never mind me,' he returned pleasantly. "'If you get such a mongrel mixture as the one sent to me, I shan't envy you the pleasure you'll get out of it.' "'It wasn't pleasant, I remember. Dora told us about it.' "'Pleasant! A regular death's head at a feast, I call it. Do read yours, Miss Clark, and see if you haven't something better.' Let me see. The mysterious stars bespeak for you better luck than you have already had. Harassed and perplexed by fickle fortune, love shall find a way. Bravo! cried John. But how could it be otherwise? If the same blood which inaugurated the Trojan Wars, of which fair Helen was the object, still runs in the veins of the god of love and fortune, they could not resist the influence of so much youth and beauty as we are blessed with here to-night. "'And what shall I say in reply to so gallant a speech, Mr. Langley? To my way of thinking, such words should be uttered to one alone. You must have forgotten Dora.' Sappho turned to the waiting child and drew him into her lap. "'Because a man is engaged to one girl, does that spoil all the pleasure which lies in meeting others?' One woman can never tie my wandering fancy. My heart is large enough to appreciate the charms of the fair sex wherever discovered. Dora don't like it, I know, but she'll get used to it after we are married, he said recklessly. Sappho kissed the child on her lap, and, placing the postage for her letter in his hand, told him to run away. Truly, Mr. Langley, you appear in a new light. Why do you tell your thoughts to me, who am Dora's friend? I do not wish to hear them. There was a mocking smile on his face as he turned to her from watching the child. "'A pretty boy, that. His beauty is of a rare kind. Do you know, I fancy that he resembles you. Really, Mr. Langley, you grow very strange in your conversation. I shall have to beg you to excuse me.' And with a haughty little bow she left the place. John watched her departure with a slight smile on his face. "'Oh, beauty is the wine of life, fair woman for me,' he hummed beneath his moustache. The smile was still on his face as he ordered a cup of coffee and proceeded to drink it leisurely. The fair had been very popular, the most successful from a business point of view. The week was now drawing to a close. The community was on the qui vive over the rivalry between Mrs. Robinson and Mrs. Davis. Racy developments were looked for on the closing night— Every woman had ranged herself on one side or the other, and not a few of the men had been led by their vigorous wives to declare themselves for a chosen leader. Friday night was to end the sale of votes on the prizes. Saturday was to be devoted to counting up the votes, so that at nine o'clock that night the successful winners could be announced. The pastor was asked to allow the fair to run another week, but he declined emphatically, saying that so many controversies had grown out of it that another week would seriously deplete his membership and bring disaster upon the cause of religion. So that idea was abandoned. Wednesday Mrs. Robinson was ahead on the piano, but behind on the dining-room receipts. Thursday night Mrs. Davis was ahead on the piano, but behind on the receipts in the refreshment room. So luck fluctuated until the rivals found themselves neck and neck, so to speak, at eight o'clock on Friday night. Any one who had watched Mrs. Robinson would have noticed that her face wore a satisfied smirk which told that she anticipated an easy victory, and the knowing ones of her satellites told each other that Sis Robertson was all right. Mrs. Davis viewed the action of her rival with stolid countenance, from which the envoys of the other side, who stood about trying to catch a word to repeat to their champion, could gain no comfort. To her trusted henchman she whispered, "'Just you watch me keep em guessin. I goin' to show em shortly that the race am not to the swiffer nor the battle to the stronger, but to her what endures until the end.' As half-past seven approached, various savory smells could be traced to the old southern dining-room, 
but above all the enticing scents which were ever introduced to aggravate the palate of the lover of good living, the knowing ones could trace the odor of a rare and tempting dainty, the possum. Yes, Mrs. Robinson had conspired with her southern friends and received a tempting animal direct from the old dominion, and on this eventful night she stood in the middle of the dining-room, triumphantly directing the placing of the dish on the main table, which was carefully arranged with covers laid for twenty-five persons. The ordinary patrons of the room were turned from the door, and even the pastor was not allowed to enter, being told that the dining-room had been engaged for an hour by a private party. At eight o'clock a message was brought to her by a lad stationed at the outside entrance to the vestry, and Mrs. Robinson immediately hurried to the door to receive a sleigh-load of young white ladies and gentlemen who had come from among the wealthy people of the city, for whom Mrs. Robinson was a faithful servant, to help her triumph over her enemies. With head thrown back and held very high, and satisfaction beaming from her countenance, the good sister marched in at the head of the company, like a successful warrior on his return from victory. The assembled company made way, gazing with awe upon so many representatives of wealth and influence. Then they were lost within the sacred precincts of the dining-room into which Mrs. Robinson ushered them. The pastor was sent for presently, and attended by the most prominent trustee on the board, he waited upon the guests who had so honoured his flock. During the interview which ensued, the door was closed to the gaze of the inquisitive crowd, but after half an hour the good man came forth with the guests, and proceeded to show them the points of interest in the fair. A few minutes before nine they took their departure, seemingly well pleased with what they had seen. "'Well, Sis Davis,' said one of the brothers, when the door closed upon the visitors, and the company felt at liberty to enjoy itself after its own fashion. "'Well, sister, that brother gets ahead of you. Sis Robinson's got you dead sure this time.' He laughed with a good-natured chuckle, which was meant to be very aggravating. "'Beats who? Me?' snorted Mrs. Davis, as she turned upon the questioner with a stony stare. "'White folks don't scare Ophelia Davis. I seed em before in my life, and I've eat at the table with em, that's more. Didn't have to have the door shut on me to keep me out of the dining-room, cause they was feared the black would rub off. I think too much of my white people to trot em up here to this one-cent fair. "'No use, Sis Davis. We's got you,' laughed another member who had just come up. "'Robertson's smart.' "'Smart!' cried the irate woman, now thoroughly angry. "'You all's having your hallelujah meetin' too soon. "'Don't holler till you knows what you're hollerin' about. "'I ain't beat till nine o'clock sharp when the polls is closed.' Five minutes is all you's got anyhow. "'Can't change much in five minutes,' laughed another. "'Just at this moment a messenger-boy made his way from the door "'and was conducted to the judge's seat. "'He handed them an envelope, which upon being opened "'was seen to contain two bits of paper.' "'Please step this way, Mrs. Davis, and make your mark for value received,' called out one of the judges. Mrs. Davis was escorted to the table by a curious crowd, anxious to know the meaning of this latest sensation. The judge stood up after she had signed, and said, "'Ladies and gentlemen, knowing the interest that you take in all that relates to the two ladies who are rival candidates for the piano, and also for the ten dollars for the largest amount taken at refreshment table,' I beg leave to state that one hundred and fifty dollars have been contributed by Mrs. Mason and Mrs. Molly Mason Farnham to be used for buying votes in the favor of Mrs. Davis in the contest for the piano, and to swell the receipts at her refreshment tables. As I hold my watch in my hand, it is now one minute of the closing hour of the polls. Any more votes? He paused and looked around. No more? "'Then I have the honour of informing you that the polls are closed. "'No more tickets can be bought, and I may as well say right here "'that Sister Davis will have the most votes. "'She'll stand at least five hundred ahead. "'Now I propose that we give three cheers for Sister Davis.' "'And they were given with a will, led by the pastor, "'who stood upon a chair and swung his bandana handkerchief wildly in the air. "'Mrs. Davis was greatly excited.' "'Sis Robinson's got me, has she? Beat, am I? How about it, honeys, how about it?' 
Sister Mary Jane Robinson was carried home sick in a herdic. The next night brought a great crowd to see the distribution of the prizes. The fun waxed warmer and warmer as each name was called. When young Mandy Jackson was called to receive the diamond pin, her twin brothers turned handsprings in the aisle and yelled out, "'Hi, Mandy, you're a peach. We uns did the business for you, your bet.' Sister Susanna Johnson received the much-coveted silver set, and thought with pride of the handsome sideboard, and made up her mind then and there to give the stewardess board such a tea as they had not had for many a day, before another week rolled over her head. Jim Anderson walked up to the judge's stand, feeling very bashful, and with a fearful grin on his face, when his name was called for the gold watch and chain. "'Wet it, Jim! Wet it!' cried one of his friends." "'Set him up, old man!' roared another as Jim returned to his seat. "'Don't be shamed. Do the right thing by the boys.' Jim Anderson was angry. He was a trustee, and was looked up to by all the young members as an exemplary Christian. Jim made up his mind not to stand it, and he paused on the way to his seat, and offered to take the speaker and set him up, by standing him on his head if he'd only come out where he could get at him, making a fool of him right out in church.' This stopped the fun in that direction, for Jim was a beef-lugger at the big market, and they had a wholesome regard for his muscle. But when Mrs. Davis was called for the piano and the ten dollars, the excitement broke out with renewed vigor. "'Speech! Speech!' resounded from all over the hall. "'You must say a word to your friends, sister,' said the pastor. Then she stood up. "'Friends!' I'm much obligated to you for making all this noise for me, but being a lonesome old woman, and with no education, I can't make no speech. I'll just say there's nothing mean about me. I don't feel good, cause some of us is took sick long o' all this. Now, Pastor, I want you to take this ten dollars over to Sis Robinson, and tell her we's quits, and I forgive her for all her mean feelings to me. Will you do it? The pastor promised, and for a while pandemonium reigned, and after that the pastor could not forbear saying a few words about how good it was to dwell together in brotherly love. Sister Sarah Ann White said, The brothers had nothing to do with it. It was Ophelia Davis and nobody else. Mrs. Davis, true to her word, had not forgotten the pastor, and all the women, mindful of the feeling engendered by Mrs. Robinson against him, had secretly gone about among the four hundred, and money enough had been contributed to buy him a fine new Sunday suit, made up in the latest clerical fashion. After all the prizes had been presented, the women formed in a body, and headed by Ma Smith, marched up to the judges' seats and presented him with the result of their good feelings. So everybody was made happy." It was estimated that the proceeds of the fair exceeded the eight thousand dollars hoped for, and no church had more sincere cause to rejoice on the next Easter Sunday than the body of people comprising the church on X Street, who on that memorable day consecrated anew to God their house of worship, free from all encumbrances. End of chapter 11